It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. we got a great team here for you. Brian McCullough from Tech Meme Ride right Home Podcast, uh, the Technologizer. Harry McCracken is here. And Alex Lindsay from Mac Break Weekly and OfficeHours.Global. We celebrate 17 years of podcasting together, uh, our 17th anniversary. And we're going to have a fun one. We could talk about Elon Musk, how Bill Gates kind of introduced AR and VR and the future in 1996. Mark Zuckerberg's huge security bill and a whole lot more this week in tech is next. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit. This week in tech, episode 871, recorded April 17th, 2022. 17 years, 10,000 mistakes. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Checkout.com. Modern businesses need flexible payment systems that can help them adapt to change, grow, and scale fast. Discover how Checkout.com can help your business thrive at Checkout.com slash twit. And by ZipRecruiter. According to research, 90% of employers plan to enhance their employee experience this year. And if you need to add more employees, there's ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter's technology finds qualified candidates for your job, and you can invite your top choices to apply. Try ZipRecruiter free today at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And by 8Sleep. Good sleep is the ultimate game changer and nature's best medicine. Go to 8sleep.com slash twit to check out the Pod Pro cover and save $150 at checkout. 8sleep currently ships within the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. And by Blue Land. Stop wasting water and throwing out more plastic. Get Blue Land's revolutionary refill cleaning system instead. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash twit. It's time for Twit! This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. We have uh, brought Harry McCracken into the studio, braving danger to come in maskless. It's good to see you, Harry. Good to see you, Leo. <laughs> Leading back. You forgot how uncomfortable those chairs are. Yeah, well, it's, it's, at this point, it's a good uncomfortable. It's a good, it's a good uncomfortable, uncomfortable just to be anybody, anywhere. I know. At home. So great to see you. Harry is a global technology editor at Fast Company, longtime technologizer. And we were just thinking back, because this is today, technically, the 17th anniversary of Twit. And we're thinking back to when you first appeared, and we actually found it. It was 18, uh, 2008. It was 14 years ago. Almost 14 years ago. Your very the first summer appearance. Summer of 2008. Isn't right that after, cool? Right after I left PC World. Yeah, actually, you uh, you left PC World because they had taken down an uh, uh, article that you, about not liking Apple or something like that. I Am left, I... then I came back, then I left again, and that was at the point at which uh, you were nice enough to ask me on. It was Twit 148 S Porn. I don't know what the topic was. <laughs> it was you, John C. Dvorak, and Will Harris, and it was audio only. Wither, Jerry Yang, and Yahoo. <laughs> the 114 executives have left since I, 2007. I guess that was when Jerry Yang was back as yep. CEO, maybe? Yep. In fact, Dvorak, leave Jerry alone. Let him manage Yahoo. Microsoft without Gates, because Gates, Gates was Gates retiring. Gates resigned uh, yep. or become chairman or whatever. I think he actually, 2008, I think he, that was the one where they made the video of him packing up all his stuff and getting in his, in his uh, Buick to leave. <laughs> Uh, ice discovered on Mars. I wonder how that's worked out. Um, Firefox was huge. Oh, that's sad. Firefox yeah. 3 topped 8 million downloads in a day. The golden age of Mozilla. And NVIDIA released their hot new graphics card, the GTX 280. <laughs> We're now at the 2080. So uh, a thousand cards ago. You recommended Flock, which I really loved when I was around. Remember Flock? Flock. The what social web happened browser. to that? And WebKit and Foxmark's Pick Lens handbrake. Handbrake's still around. Handbrake's still around. Yeah, of the of the bunch. Uh wow. WebKit is still around. Yeah, it's been a, it's been 17 years, 14 since your first appearance. Alex Lindsay, you probably go back even farther. I'm guessing. I think so. 
I think so. I think I'm oh, nine oh media earlier, and office hours dot global. Alex and I started working together with Mac Break. Uh, well, with with uh, screensavers, I think. Well, I mean, of, yeah, uh, I mean, call for help. But yeah, but, but, yeah, you were on Tech TV in the day, but uh, podcast. I think it was on Twit before 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 Mac Break started. I think it was because we started doing the video ones. Remember, and they got those. The first one was a whole bunch of different cameras, and I told Leo that I could do it. I, I was like, we, we can do a multi camera. I'd never done a multi camera. I so I so I we shot them all at that at at, Ro at Moylan's, and uh, I remember. I am eternally I spent, grateful I to you because of later. you. We did a 3D, remember the Ozo camera? Oh, yeah. Shoot of Mac Break in 3D. And I'm, what I'm really happy about is that is the best record uh, still around of the old Brick House studio. Was oh, it really? <laughs> yes, if you look at it, funny. if you watch the show... Yeah, yeah, but you wouldn't. There you are, and we can we can we can see the whole studio, right. and the operation, and how things were working. And I have to admit, I forgot I even did that. <laughs> you can even see what's going on in the street outside. Yeah, thank you for doing that. There's Renee. It yeah. was a lot There's of fun. Alex, yeah, Andy, and and you know what? That was episode 500. Yeah, so was, we had a cake. <laughs> the Ozo was a pretty good camera. It was fun. It was a fun camera. No cake for today because it's only 17, and prime numbers do not deserve cakes. But already I special. But <laughs> Ashley in our marketing department said, what are you going to do? I said, well, nothing. She said, it's the 17th. There's no podcasts that are 17 years old. I said, what? Call me on my 20th. 18, when we get 20. 18 is fairly big. 18 might be me. It's divisible, at least. If a prime number, you shouldn't do it. Also here with us, a relatively newcomer. He's been on our show many times, but, uh, but he started late, later than these two. Brian McCullough from Tech Meme this Ride Home. Probably my, I've been on, coming on for four years now. So, yeah. yes, I'm nothing, a, a child, a complete noob. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to believe 17 years. So many great people have come and gone. <laughs> uh oh, here comes the immemorial. But like a fish, yeah, we should do that. I, I could sing a song. Let me say, um, try to remember that time. And say, I could just could do the whole thing, but I'm not going to do that. Not going to do that. It's funny to look back, though, on these older shows, on the stories that we were talking about. If in my wildest imagination, you know, Harry said, do you think in 2005 when you started Twit, you'd think you'd be doing this? Maybe, but I never would have thought some guy named Elon Musk would have been trying to buy a thing called Twitter. <laughs> Twitter was still a year off at that point. Twitter yeah. hadn't happened yet. Elon Musk was... I actually, I found a... Uh, PayPal was his first, right? Well, so. I found a 1999 profile of uh, Elon from uh, Salon the other day, which uh, is still a good read. Oh. And, and predicts that he will go on to do big things. And it was when he was doing um, X, which maybe merged with PayPal. He had another payment system that, yeah. that was So it was, it was even like pre-PayPal. Um, and his first, Leo, his first startup was Zip2. Zip, yes. if you remember that. Zip2 was his Zip big two. success at that point. Right. And, and that Zip was also two, a payment, sold, right? Uh, founded X, then X. There's there's a book that just came out a couple months ago that is all about the the PayPal story. Not even the PayPal mafia, but like just the story of PayPal. Because um, it, it, you think Twitter's uh, situation was crazy. You know, people were there were boardroom coups. There were all sorts of shenanigans going on. Here is the article from 1999 in Salon. It's still online. Elon Musk is poised. To become Silicon Valley's next big thing. Oh, they had no idea, did they? What put him in the driver's seat? Driver's seat. Get it? Uh, Pre-Tesla. Yeah, it's pre-Tesla. He didn't start Tesla, by the way. He bought yeah. Tesla, he right? He was a uh, advisor and investor originally. Yeah. Uh, X.com. So, let's see. Musk, who is 28 at the time of this article, was driving a McLaren F1. Uh because he'd sold his one internet company, Zip to a creator of online city guides, Compaq bought it. <laughs> Compaq gave us Elon Musk pretty much. <laughs> For $307 million in cash. He and his brother Kimball held about 12% of the company and made out with tens of millions. Now he's starting, Salon says, X.com, which may be the hottest company in Silicon Valley you've never heard of and probably still haven't ever heard of. <laughs> It's so funny. There's no way you can predict any of this stuff, right? There's, there's no way. Although, hey, at least uh, Salon was, and Mark uh, Gimeon, or Gimeen, who wrote this, was savvy enough to know Elon had a good future ahead of him. The author can certainly take some credit for yeah. identifying him as an intriguing person. Yeah, and 
he was right. Now Elon is doing, I don't know what, I think, honestly, I'm curious what you guys think. This sounds like a classic pump and dump scam to me. So you know the timeline. We've been talking about it for a couple of weeks. Elon secretly over the first three months of the year buying up bits of Twitter, finally coming out and saying, I have a controlling interest. By the way, weeks after he was supposed to, violation number one, he hid the fact that he was buying it up even after he crossed the 5% threshold. There is already a shareholder lawsuit over that because since he didn't announce it, he could continue to buy it up at lower prices. When he finally does announce it, he has 9.2%, about $3 billion investment in Twitter. Stock price goes up 27% on the announcement. Now, that would have been a good time to sell, make a cool billion, but no. No. He gets offered a board seat. We don't know if he turned it down. This was last week. Did he turn it down? Did they decide not to give him the board seat? My thinking was at the time, this is, this is Twitter saying, be on the board, then you can only have 15%. We're safe. You can't do a hostile takeover if you're on the board. I think Elon said, yeah, thanks, but uh, no thanks, after all sorts of ridiculous tweets, which he has since deleted, including proposing that they rename Twitter Titter. That's funny, Elon. Uh, then announces this week, $43 billion, I want the whole thing. An unsolicited bid, i.e. hostile takeover. Uh, but what's interesting, I think he thought at that time offering $54 a share, which is about six bucks more than it was going uh, for, that he probably thought, oh, this will boost it up a little more and then I can sell it all. See, that's my theory. What do you think, Harry? I, I mean, it's Elon Musk, so it's hard to know. <laughs> it, 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 it's interesting. So many people are so confident they know what he's thinking or know what Twitter would be like. I don't. If he took charge. No. Yeah. Uh, some people think it would, it would be fantastic for him to take over. Some think it would be the end of a democracy. <laughs> I don't uh, think it'd be that bad. I don't think Twitter's that well, important. Well, somebody said that. Yeah. Uh, or yeah. maybe not the end of democracy, but destructive to democracy. I think it's just really hard to say. I mean, my instinct, which might or might not be right, is that he is just sort of yanking their chain, and uh, it's fun to make them We know squirm. that. At least that. Uh, there was this brief moment where they said he's going to be on the board, and that's wonderful. He, he leads with his heart. We're going to do great things together. Uh, and that collapsed. And, and He was supposed days. to do an AMA with the Twitter staff that was... Some, at least, concerned about his ownership, and then that got canceled. Um, now they had an AMA with the Twitter staff explaining what they're going to do about Elon Musk. I mean, in a way, it. he can't lose. He, either he has fun yanking right. their chain, or he, he takes control. Brian, you were going to say something. I, I cut you off. What, what do you think? Um, well, so here in New York, I'm, I'm friendly with, with finance and Wall Street World uh, folks, <laughs> and they've been taking it not very seriously until the rumors that various private equity uh, folks were going to get together to help them with this bid, but they're still extremely skeptical of it for the simple of, of the deal actually happening. Because one thing we haven't talked about is, um, you know, billionaires have most of their money sort of tied up in the stock that makes them billionaires. So he would have to sell a huge, I think it's like a fifth of his Tesla stock. If he wanted to do, if he wanted to buy it all himself, and that's not going to help Tesla. Number two, um, if he were to, uh, if he were to get, say, a private equity firm to, you know, go cowboy with him and like, let's do this, they're they're going to want him to transform the business. They're not going to want to do necessarily what he seems to want to do, which is mess with all of Twitter's operations and rules and 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 you know, he's talking about free speech and all these things. So the, the reason that the people on Wall Street that I've talked to remain skeptical for the most part is that they don't think that anybody with enough money or reputable enough will will sign off on this because they won't believe that Elon will make it a better business. Like he might make Twitter into the Twitter he wants it to be, but they're going to want him to four or five X Twitter. And I don't know that no one could do that. I don't know that anyone can do that. Yeah. And I especially think that no one believes that Elon right. would do that. Well, and we know that if you look at the stock market, because if you offer six bucks above the current going rate of a stock, that would normally increase the value of the stock. The fact that the stock market didn't do anything tells you that as a whole, the stock market said, yeah, he's not going to pull this off. Right. That's a that's a yeah, that's the, the stock the real, market. Saying, the, real thing that they, the real thing that the finance people have told me is that this puts Twitter in play. Again, that's which the it bigger has issue. Times. That's yeah. the bigger issue. Yeah, Twitter's been in play before. Bill Gross tried to buy it some years ago. I remember. Uh, for yeah, I just million. don't think. <laughs> I think it'd be Does hard to be considered buying it. 
yeah. you know, yeah. briefly. I, I think it'd just be hard to move the needle. Like, I think that's the, that's the issue of, I mean, of its value. You know, I think Twitter, I mean, all of these social networks are kind of, they're a little long in the tooth. Um, they were... They were really cool ideas when they started, but that's 15 years ago. There's a lot of technical debt, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, established mentalities. Um, so I think that, and they're big, <laughs> hard to move, hard to turn. That, that's, that's what they have hard, you know, it's a big ship now. And so I think that it would be very difficult to make a dramatic change in the financial future of Twitter. It, it is what it is. Even Elon mm -hmm. and a TED talk to, or a TED interview with Chris Anderson this week said, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. And then, of course, he puts Twitter in play. And now they're thinking maybe Oracle, Larry Ellison and others might step in and try to acquire another hostile takeover. And, of course, the Twitter, is, the Twitter board has adopted a what they call a poison pill strategy. I'll let you describe that, Brian. <laughs> Essentially, you make it really, really expensive uh, to, to continue the buyout. But let me give you one more conspiracy theory that I've heard because it sort of lines up with the, the TikTok of how this has happened. Um, Elon is still technically, um, remember when he did the 420 thing? There's all sorts of things with the SEC. Yeah, he got still, fined $20 million. But, but Tesla got fined $20 million with the SEC. It's still wide open. Like, so it's not resolved yet. No, he's so, now saying, I'm not going to adhere to the agreement. Exactly. Uh, it was wrong. I'm going to try to get that overturned. Because, so the, by the, the way, one of the I, things he agreed to was have a lawyer vet every one of his tweets, which he obviously has not been doing. So this is this is the this is the theory that really what he wants to do is get out from under the thumb of this, of the lawyers, of the SEC. He wants to be able to say whatever he want, at, wants and not have to worry about there being any repercussions. So, OK, I'll become Twitter's biggest shareholder and then maybe no one can tell me what I can and can't tweet. OK, I'll go on the board. If I'm a board member, no one can tell me what I can and can't tweet. And every step of the way, he's found out. Oh, no, but you're, the SEC is still going to come for you. Oh, no, the lawyers. In fact, if you're on the board, the lawyers are going to be worse. So it, the, I don't know that this is an Occam's razor theory, but it does sort of make it line up with the timeline of how this has happened. He just wants the freedom. And again, that gets into what I'm saying about he doesn't necessarily want to make it a, a better business. He just wants the freedom. Um, and, you know, like Matt but Levine the, says. The thing that's keeping him from the freedom is not Twitter. It's SEC. Right. Which, which would I think would have a different, uh, I, I don't know what the rules are specifically, but I believe that SEC would have less leverage if it was a private company, privately held. Oh, ah. mm -hmm. yeah. no, because I guarantee you not, because he's making tweets about a publicly held company. So it doesn't matter what the platform is that you announce fallaciously that you're going to buy this stock, buy this, you know, take this company private for 420 bucks. If right. you announce it in public, and then make money on it. That is that is pump and dump, and that is illegal, and the SEC fined him. By the way, somebody did the math. If Elon Musk's net worth is $270 billion, that's the estimate according to Forbes, and the median net worth for uh, an American is $110,000, that $20 million fine to Elon is equivalent of a small fry at McDonald's to the rest of us. In other yeah. words, I don't even think he cares. He's much more concerned. I think you're right, Brian, about being told what to say than he is I think about the he money. wants the lawyers off his back. Yeah, basically. just get out of my life. And I, yeah. I, Matt, I think Matt he, Levine's. Go ahead. What, what did Matt Levine say? And then, then yeah, go ahead. His, no, his yeah. overarching theory is that you're the richest person in the world. You play a game that's your favorite game to play, and so you want the rules to be. You want the game to run the way that you want to run it. And you you wake up one day and you realize, hey, I'm the richest man in the world. So why don't I just buy the game and change the rules to suit me? And because you're the richest man in the world, that's way too much work. You still got SpaceX and Tesla and other things. The boring company. You got flamethrowers to sell. Who ain't got? Who, you don't have time for Twitter. I think this is totally Elon, just typical trolling. Right? Go ahead, Alex. It might be, but I think that he may actually think that Twitter's broken. Like I think that you know maybe it's it's connected to the fact that. But he what does he, what he care? Wants. Oh, because he, I, you know, Twitter is influential. <laughs> like it's it's an influential he does use platform, it. and he may decide he may have a bigger picture of this of of the, this is really a broken system that needs right. to be you know needs to be fixed, and he thinks he might be able to be the one that fixes it, and he's particularly aware of it because of what he's been told, what he can and can't do. But I don't know if it's 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 as simple as he wants to say what he wants to say, and and closer to, you know, I'm being affected by this, but a lot of other people are being affected by it, and it needs to be adjusted and i can do that he's so a libertarian it's still, it's still arrogant yeah. <laughs> it's still arrogant but it's but it's there he's a libertarian he thinks more free speech is better um 
I have no reason to think that isn't a sincere aspect of, of right. why he's interested in it. I feel like Twitter has an overblown importance in society, though, partly because there's so many journalists on it and everything that gets said on Twitter gets amplified by these journalists. I mean, yeah, the average American is not on Twitter. It's, it's not, not Facebook. A, uh, Nobody's trying to buy Facebook. It's, I think it's, it's, it's that a lot of, I mean, I don't know how everyone, I, I talk to folks that are in, in the press and a lot of people have Twitter open a lot. Like, so it, oh, it, yeah, it, it may no, not affect. But it's, it is us. It, it is the press that right, amplifies, that amplifies it. it. Yeah. Cause it's a, it's a quick way to, to get, the, you know, you, you see the trends zeitgeist. coming through. Yeah. You know, it's the, I mean, the, to me, the two, the two, the two biggest ones for that actually, uh, is Twitter and tech meme. Right. You know, tw you know, the uh, things like flashing through the system and you're constantly, uh, I mean, I yeah, I know of a CEO that just keeps tech meme open on one screen all tech the time. Tech meme's legit. That's a so. that's a that's a news source. It's uh, yeah. um, tech meme used to be based on it used to be algorithmic, right, Brian? And then mm -hmm. uh, and now it is uh, you have editors, but it didn't it used to be based on tweets. It was it, well, it was it launched before Twitter. Oh, okay. Um, but there so was some was algorithm. Entirely, yeah, uh, I don't know how much Gabe wants me to tell you, but yeah, it was essentially an algorithm that then Gabe spent all day with his sort of finger on the on the dials. Yeah. Uh, and so essentially what happens now is there's 24-7. I'm on the tech meme Slack right now, and there's, there's editors. There's an editor working in India right now. So 24-7, there are people monitoring the, the algorithm and then adjusting and writing the headlines and things like that. So a lot of what they do now is they take the, um, the sort of lead from the algorithm and then decide how and in which ways to sort of craft it onto the page and which Clearly. tweets to include and things like that. Clearly, I mean, if you go to Tech Meme, and by the way, we all use this. I certainly use it. If you go to Tech Meme, you'll see references to people writing an article, but then you'll see a lot of tweets. I mean, clearly Twitter... Tech meme is to some degree much um, uh, like, uh, what was it? What was it I used to use all the time? That was all tweets all the time that they bought and ended up buying. Um, the, uh, the algorithm t gives the signal of what is important and what has landed at the top. And then they decide how and whether what it's, way. Whether it's right, yeah, yeah. Worth, worth covering or not. Uh, yeah, because you don't want you know the Kardashians living at the top there. You've really got to make sure that it's, it sticks to the hues to the uh, tech uh, topics uh nevertheless i think it's safe to say well i don't know is it i mean when trump was tweeting it was a bully pulpit for a guy who oh, theoretically yeah. has the bully well, pulpit if you get if you get enough followers i mean it does have an impact <laughs> you know, like so it's i mean you definitely have you know it, it definitely has an impact i i, I you know i have a a meager number of followers, but like every once in a while, I'll do something with Justine and Justine tweets something out and you realize she lives in an entirely different world than I do. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's like suddenly there's just this huge focus of, of things that all happen. So if you have a lot of followers, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, uh, it has a big impact. It moves a lot of people. It sells a lot of products. It, you know, moves, you know, people think about things because you're out in front of them. It's, and it's a, it's a different world because it used to be all controlled by people who, it was three networks you know, that told us what to what was happening, and then the cable networks spread it out, and the social networks spread it out some more. Yeah. So it's it's you know it's it's just a it's a it's a progression from that. It's closer to being a town square than anything else, and people keep thinking they can create their own Twitter-like thing, and it basically never works. Um, which is why Donald Trump even has his own t Twitter clone, which he's not. Um, not working. Posting on because it has no critical mass. Even Fox News created an account this week, which wasn't Fox News. There was a verified Fox News account, which turned out not to be created by Fox News on Truth and Social. It, and I think if you if you created Twitter today, it wouldn't work. Like it no. it, it it works because it's big. You know, like yeah. there's a lot of people it's that use network it. Network effect. It's, yeah. And, it, and it's simple. I mean, it's relatively simple. You know, I I like the I very much enjoy the haiku of Twitter's the only thing I really post on. And uh, I like the haiku of fitting into that <laughs> that word limit, you know, the, and um, of, of figuring out how to say what you want to say in a, in those in that number of characters. So Article it's, uh, um, this week in the Atlantic, which I recommend to everybody, it's a little long, uh, by Jonathan Haidt, who I've had on Triangulation. He's a, a professor of uh, I think sociology uh, at I think NYU. He's written a great book. Uh, about the right and left, why the past 10 years of American life have been uniquely stupid. And he puts the finger square on Facebook and Twitter, social media. 
Uh, and he's got a good argument, which I won't recreate, but he's got a very strong argument for how social media drives us to the corners, you know, drives us to the extremes. That um, America is essentially politically in the, the, the vast centra, center, very centrist. But the problem is thanks to these amplification systems, these amplification algorithms, uh, the extreme left and the extreme right have, have outsized power. I, I would I would argue that I mean they made it they may have accelerated it but they didn't start it you know as, as Billy Joel said they didn't start the fire right <laughs> like, you know the fire and and I think that the fire if, if we start looking at the fire I think we we probably go back to Lee Atwater so so the thing is is that there was an assumption in the eighties in the late eighties that you know or he came across this idea that that Karl Rove picked up speed on um, later in the nineties which was that you don't have to pay attention to the center you do the you social the core. you do the social Social get the core. Uh, politics gets the core, the base. Get the, well, not, it's not, get the, yeah, either side, get the core energized and get the opposition not to show up. Yeah. And that's all you have to do to win. Yeah. And he proved that he could do that. Karl Rove proved that he could do that. And both sides employ it now. Is that you get the core to, to show up and there's an incredible amount of energy spent on that. I will agree um, with you. The motivation was there, but in the past they've had advertising and things like that. Now they have a, a weapon, a super weapon. Oh yeah. <laughs> like a name from yeah, space. No, no. But I'm saying it, just didn't, it, didn't, Facebook. it didn't start there. It didn't no, I start agree with it, you. It, 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 they it's didn't that, but there's this, but but we saw this in the '90s where we were going, mm -hmm. oh no, like mm -hmm. this is what they're gonna, this is what's happening to politics. Started started splitting in the yep. mid '90s because the campaign started splitting. You know, like they they started in the '80s, but it really started splitting. The campaign started, and then then it started taking over. You know, because you just realized you could win that way. You know, and and I think that that's the, I mean, that's a, and then then all of this stuff it gets accelerated. And I think that there's a lot of good points in that article. One of the things of verified users, only verified users get amplified. I think it's a really good idea. You know, I yeah. think that there is a wish, the right. real issue is is not allowing machines to the, the the biggest problem I think in almost all of these things is not allowing machines to post. You know, like it has to be a person. To post it, and because the thing is, is that the I had a I, I I did some tweet. I remember years ago, I did some I did a tweet, and I have no idea why it had it got so many. It, it was running for months. It was getting huge numbers of re, you know of, of stuff. Some bot la latched onto it. It was right. not. I looked at it. It was like an innocuous tweet, but it it fulfilled some model of disinformation. <laughs> That was, and I deleted it. <laughs> like, I was like, I don't know why, I don't know why this is being used, but I don't want it to be used. And I just took it out, you know, but, but it was, um, it, cause I kept on watching it with just one tweet and it was again, very, uh, very, uh, like, I don't like ABC TV or something. I don't like this show. It was like something like that. It was a hype who, by the way, wrote a fantastic book called the righteous mind, which I highly recommend why good people are divided by politics and religion, which talks about that kind of trend that the Atwater Rove trend that you were talking about. But in this article in which he's kind of, it's kind of uh, eulogizing America, he says things changed in 2009 when Facebook offered users the like button and Twitter offered the retweet button. Those amplification mechanisms are exactly what you're talking about, whether it's wielded by humans or bots. Of course, I think it's part of the problem with Twitter. How? I mean, I know they try to get rid of bots, but I, I often have the feeling that at least half of my followers are bots. They're not humans. Remember when uh, retweeting was something you did manually? And yeah, by hand. Cutting and pasting was yeah. hard. I mean, that, that might in some ways almost have been a better way to go about it, to, to put a little friction into the process. On TweetDeck, I could turn off retweets. I do, and it is a very different Twitter, by the way, without the viral amplification <laughs> of say, retweeting. I, I, I block so many things in Twitter, and then I follow... I have like 110 terms. Anytime I see a term, I go, oh, I don't like that tweet. I look at a, I look at a word in there that makes it unique, and then I go into the word block and I say block all the tweets like that. Right. And then I and then I have all these great people that I follow that are everything coders and sound sound designers and all. I have a great Twitter. I mean, I have to admit, my I, whenever it complains about, it, I'm like, I don't understand what everyone's so upset about because mine mine is great. I agree. I have a great Reddit. There's awful stuff on Reddit, but I don't follow. Right. I don't, you know, if you don't follow it, you don't right. have to worry about it. Um, and you could do the same thing with Twitter. Uh, I don't know if that makes Twitter a better place for everybody or just for you. No, it doesn't. I'm just, I, I'm just saying. From, I'm just saying, it doesn't have to be. If you're, if you're, if you're, uh, I find going to Twitter to be enjoyable and fun. 
because I've gotten rid of almost everything I didn't want <laughs> that, that yeah. makes me stressed. Like I just, I was like, I'm not here. I'm not here to, I, Twitter is not a good source of news. You know, like it is, you know, so, so, so I took, you know, things out. I don't care whether it's news or not. I, I, I go to other pl- things like tech meme, like regular, you know, a bunch of other news, news organizations to get news and Twitter, <laughs> Twitter, I go to have fun, hang out. Yeah. You know, yeah. see, see interesting things. Yeah. Twitter, I just go to see who died. Uh, because if you're trending, chances are you're dead. (laughs) What I've been asking people all week is let's say Elon does take over Twitter. Let's say he brings in a whole new regime and and how things are done. Um, Is there something that he could do that would kill Twitter for you? And, and, and because I've been asking people like, you know, Twitter has been famous for not iterating on its product, but I feel like they know that it's so delicate that they don't want to do it. So if he comes in there and stomps around and changes a whole bunch of stuff, would it be certain people like the people that you love following leaving? Like what, what would be the thing for any of you that would make you be like, well, Twitter used to be great, but I just don't do it anymore. That's a really good longer, question. Higher character count. <laughs> like if, Did if, it get if, worse if, for you when they if, went to 280? No, 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 no. I think, I think the current number is 280 is good, okay. but, but I think it's great. I think that 140 was a little like, a little cramped. Uh, I think I think the current number is really good, but I think that if we made it longer than that, I'd stop using it because it'd just be oh my gosh. Like I, if I see an article that's too long, I'm like okay, that's a lot of words. Um, and so the um, uh, so I think that that you know the longer that that would probably. Be, I think the biggest problem is is that they're just going to get a lot of regulation. Like if he does a bunch of, he can say whatever. Maybe he can say whatever he wants, but Twitter is going to be in all kinds of hot water if it starts to you know dramatically change in a direction that makes countries concerned. You know, and so I think that that's more of what puts it under pressure. There's some evidence that they're working on. I want to say it's called something like Twitter articles, but maybe not not extending the character count, but letting you attach something longer, uh, which people, of course, always do just by putting in screenshots. Um, but that might be a which good I, way of which I summarily the ignore. Yeah, I agree. I think so. You know, I don't like Twitter threads either, where you put a blog post in fifteen that. Twitter posts. That bothers me too. I hate that. Uh, the like top to articles thing, which is part of Twitter Blue, is Twitter's kind of way of of doing that. Um, yeah, I'm always like, get a get a blog. Like if you're going to write something longer than two hundred yeah. characters. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, the, the Twitter place. Blue feature, which is sort of their. Um, repackaged version of the idea behind Nuzzle. Nuzzle. That was what I was trying to remember in the past. Nuzzle was entirely Twitter driven. Yeah. I loved Nuzzle. Jonathan Abrams, uh, the guy who created Friendster uh, last act and Twitter bought it and they kind of turned this into top articles, acknowledging that they are in fact a good place to get signals about what the zeitgeist is. Uh, I think that they, you know, a lot of times they just have a hard time doing, like everybody, all these companies have, they're not very good at many things. They're good at one thing that pays for everything. So Twitter's got a good feed. You know, Google has Google AdWords and display ads. Everything else isn't, you know, they, they do the best they can. Mail, mail turned out well and YouTube turned out well, but they bought that. But the, but most of it is, you know, like most of their ideas, you know, kind of go all over the place. And then Twitter, like they, they put out live streaming. I'm, I'm a, I do live streaming. So I think about this, it's the worst platform for it. And you're like, it wouldn't be very hard to fix, but they... You know, they, they seem they don't to bungle do that well. a lot. Remember, they had they bought oh Vine gosh. and killed it. Mm, what is, what does Twitter call it? It's not Reels. What do they call it? Uh, spaces. Spaces. Yeah, it's like that's their the clubhouse. Club, clubhouse. They had, uh, fleets for a while. Fleets. Um, that failed, right? Twitter Spaces is fun. We fast company. We've been doing Twitter Spaces, and uh, actually, we, pretty cool. We record all of our uh, interview episodes on Spaces now. Because it's just so much, it's so easy to, we've done it, we've been, ta- we, we've done spaces where like Kayvon Bakepoor of Twitter comes on because we're talking about Twitter product. And so he'll pop in and it's, it's really great for if you're talking about a topic and then somebody involved in that topic happens by and you say, well, come up on stage and then, you know. That's Clubhouse, it's, it's, right? That's what. Yeah, it is Clubhouse, yeah. but it's for, for podcasting purposes, it's amazing. And it makes a lot of sense for it to be part of a Twitter if you already are part of a community there versus having to become part of a community on Clubhouse right. that right. Uh, you're not right. already invested in. Are people in. still using Clubhouse? Yeah. Is anyone using <laughs> It isn't the there? number one download on, on the like App Clubhouse. Store, but people still We use got really it. excited about it for a while. We did a bunch of Clubhouse stuff and then we're like, yeah. okay. We're, we're Why don't, Clubhouse. so uh, this is my Twitter feed. Why don't I see Spaces? I used to see it at the top. Uh, because right? um, it's only mobile. It's... Uh, it's only. I think you can maybe you can listen online, but in you order to, to participate, you need to be on a phone. You can't even do it on an iPad at this point. Wow. 
Yeah, it's um, a big attempt to level things out. That they build it out a bit. Yeah. Um, you also, they, if you're one of the speakers, you only get in at the same time your audience does. So a lot of the time, the first couple of minutes are the speakers kind of getting their act to get together <laughs> and, and, re and realizing they need to be on a phone. And it would be much nicer if you could kind of get come in five minutes early and uh, get yourself acclimated. Oh, don't but tell anyone really that's a hit and that they build too. it out. What do you do? What do you do? Brian? I was going to say, don't tell anyone that's how Twit works, too, that we talk for 20 minutes before we yeah, exactly. start. Yeah, What? Well, and so you didn't tell we, me? No. So, <laughs> so we did figure out how to hack that, that, that problem you know, oh, of, of the speakers yes. getting their, their wits about them. Yeah, so what you do is there's a, um, there's a little box by a company called Studio Technologies. It's a, I can't remember what, which number it is. I have it around here somewhere. But it's, a, it's what's called a Dante to Bluetooth. So what it does is it, it's a little, it just has an ethernet that pops in the back. Dante is, a, is an audio patching system that we use in events. And it looks like a headphone to the phone, right? And so it shows up as a, blue, it says, I'm a Bluetooth headphone. But what it does, does is it connects it to your, um, your entire audio system. <laughs> like, you know, so now, so I have a, like this mic and everything else can be inside of spaces or, or clubhouse. But then you can run the whole show if you wanted to <laughs> from somewhere else. Because we, we just didn't like the audio quality. So we were like, and, and we didn't like not be able to do pre-show and everything else. And so we just, we did this a lot with Clubhouse, but it would work with Spaces as well, where you just have, you can have the whole conversation. We actually were doing the conversation over Zoom and then pumping it back into, into, uh, into Clubhouse. And then everything sounds good. And we have all of our back channels and everything do else. Do normal like people know about Twitter? I mean, I know they see it on they TV. They know about them. I don't think they actually. They know it exists. Um, they, I don't, yeah. But they I, don't use it. They're watching all these TV shows that are 50% yeah. showing tweets. Right. Uh, yeah. My, my parents know about Twitter, but they don't read they it. They would never join it or no. use it. I think most of my family doesn't actually read it. That's the biggest they're problem for Twitter, right? They only have 350 million active users, and, uh, you know, it's, and that's global. Uh, that's the biggest problem right there. It turned out it's probably not something a billion people are going to use. It's a niche uh, product compared to Facebook anyway. I mean, I think it's a, it's a sad commentary in some ways on um, the tech business that you can have that many people on your service and it's a disappointment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, compared to the days point. of magazines where there, right. you know... Uh, oh, if you had 350 million <laughs> subscribers to Time Magazine, if you had a, you know, you'd be done. At PC World, we had 1.25 million and that was, that was astonishing at the yeah, time. that's but, a huge number. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wish there was more of a place for things that like Twitter that were quite large, but not one to two billion people. I but don't mind. We're niche. Twit's niche. Podcasting is for the most part niche, unless it's Caller Daddy or Joe Rogan. I, think I was going to say, Leo, like the argument for Twitter is that it's a smaller audience, but maybe it's a more valuable audience. I mean, that hasn't been proven out by their revenue numbers. But um, again, that gets back to the beginning of this argument, which is, well, this is where the journalists and the famous people and that like this is where the... That's kind of what you want to be, right? The uh, right. influencer, the one that... It, it, that, that was the word that I was trying to avoid. Outsized weight. Oh, sorry. I made you use yeah. it. Out. All right, I'm going to take a break because I'm done with Twitter. <laughs> I quit Twitter on a regular basis. We're going to take a little break, come back. There is more tech news. There's other stuff to talk about, so let's do it. We've got a great panel. Brian McCullough is here from Tech Meme Ride Home every single day, sometimes even on weekends. He is the galactic host, it says, so congratulations on that. <laughs> we decided to give you a title because he was jealous because Harry McCracken is now the global technology editor at Fast Company. Congratulations on that. And, of course, normally uh, we see him on Tuesdays on Mac Break Weekly and, of course, every day on officehours.global. Alex Lindsay is here. Our show today brought to you by Checkout.com. Tech should be... I think we can agree. Groundbreaking should promote innovation. That's not something you normally say about traditional payment systems. They're layered. They're disconnected. They're often perceived as a cost center to your business. Modern businesses need flexible payment systems that can help them adapt to change, to grow and scale fast, and it's not going to break the bank. I recently came across a company with tech that approaches payments through a new lens, and I'm really pleased to share it with you. Checkout dot. Now, you've seen Checkout. If you buy things on Shein, the Chinese uh, multi-billion dollar clothing conglomerate, they use Checkout.com. So does Grab, Sony Electronics, Wise, Henkel. Checkout.com is the leading global payment solutions provider. Their flexible payments platform is purpose-built with performance, scalability, and speed in mind. 
Imagine how many transactions a second Shein has to process. I mean, it's mind-boggling. That's why Checkout works for them. Ideal for any business looking to seamlessly integrate better payment solutions globally. With a dedicated team of local experts spanning 19 offices in five continents, they're there for you. Checkout.com offers a strategic partnership to help businesses improve their acceptance rates, optimize their payments, their performance to grow their business globally. Enable your business and your community to thrive in the digital economy. Checkout.com delivers innovative payment solutions that flex to your needs, valuable insights to help you get smart about your payments performance and expertise you can count on as you navigate the complexities of an ever-shifting digital world. It's nice to have a company that treats you as a partner and helps you make this work. With Checkout.com, you get global optimization. They provide local acqu acquiring in multiple geographies, improving authorization rates, lowering costs. And after all, I think your customers appreciate having a local checkout solution, not someone outside your country. And with the in-depth reporting they offer, you get visibility no matter where you operate. But that local expertise is so important. Their dedicated local teams bring regional, international, and yeah, it's important too, regulatory exper expertise along, allowing you to navigate market complexities with confidence and, of course, they are a partner. They take a collaborative, personalized approach to solving complex problems for their merchants and their ecosystems. I think I've given you about 12 reasons why you should be checking out Checkout.com. Discover how Checkout.com can help your business thrive. Go to Checkout.com slash twit. Checkout.com slash twit. Please use that address so they know you saw it here. Checkout.com slash twit. All right, let's get back to the week's tech news. We've done the Elon Musk beat. We'll be doing that for weeks to come, I'm sure. It's one thing you got to love somebody who's giving you more headlines, right? Brian, did you spend every episode of Tech Meme Ride Home this week talking about, probably did, talking about Elon? I, ap I, I opened one show apologizing, saying, listen, sometimes even when I don't want to talk about it, <laughs> there's nothing I can do. It's the top story that everybody's talking about. Yeah. So even though we've done this four days in a row, guess what? Guess what? Here we go again. Yep. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, we could talk about Ukraine. Of course, that's the uh, eternal story if you watch uh, cable news. Uh, but there is a tech story. The uh, You may remember back in 2015, and I, this concerned me. I remember this. Uh, the Ukraine grid went down for a number of hours under attack, we thought, from nation state actors, probably Russia. Uh, that, that At that time, uh, that was a malware used by, they found out, Samworm in 2016, which is the uh, one of the names for the GRU's, uh, the Russian uh, military intelligence hacking group. I think it's Fancy Bear, Cozy Bear. They have all the, all the cute little names, Sandworm. Uh, they were using Indestroyer. Well, this is the problem when you reuse malware. ESET and Microsoft say they stopped an attack this week on the Ukraine grid, discovering a new variant of the same old worm that they used back in 2016. Uh, the U Ukraine governmental computer emergency response team said the attack went after several infrastructure elements, including high-voltage electrical substations, computers at the facility, network equipment, and server equipment running Linux. Two waves of attack. The initial compromise had happened back in February... And then they triggered it Friday, April 8th. They triggered it in the evening. Uh, but ESET and Microsoft saw it and stopped it. So the good news is uh, we have talked a lot about cyber warfare being one of the consequences of the Ukraine uh, war invasion. And uh, even the U.S. might be uh, victims of this. But the problem, of course, is uh, you can't use these tools more than once. And, you you know, you kind of have to save your powder, I guess, until the time is right. And I've been wondering, why haven't we seen more attacks? Well, here's mm. one reason. They were ready. I, they saw I it keep, coming. I keep wanting to ask that question, and I'm so afraid that I'm going to jinx as soon as I say that. Yeah, I know. Knock on wood, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think certain the U.S. Uh, has been very active uh, in protecting, and CISA have been very active in in 
you know, going to the electrical grid providers, for instance, in the U.S. and saying, hey, watch out. Here's what to be watching for. Helping them. They've been, they've been spending money to help them lock down their network. And yeah, knock on wood, we haven't seen anything yet. Maybe we won't. You know, the, the hard part with when you do any kind of attack, you got to make sure that it's going to be effective because you're showing something like this is what you can see here, right? They showed it, you know, back a couple years ago. And then when they try to do it again, it's hard to do it again. And that's why you want to keep your powder dry in this area. So, so unless they feel like they're really going to be able to succeed and Russia has not proven that they can see it succeed at many things. Yeah. So I think that, you know, using, uh, you know, just firing off an attack, they have to really feel like they can, they're going to achieve the result or it's not worth using up whatever secret that they figured out. Exactly. Uh, and maybe the Russian military isn't quite as advanced as we thought. You saw this. I don't know if you did. Maybe uh, the drone. The drone. Oh, my gosh. Ukraine soldier tears down Russian drone, finds a cannon rebel camera inside. <laughs> with the, I would uh, use at least a Mark II. That's all I'm saying. It's <laughs> a TS-1. Uh, <laughs> and they had glued down the, uh, the photo dial so it couldn't accidentally go into manual mode or anything like that. I mean, to put it in perspective, DJI's, DJI's cameras are nicer than our yeah. camera, like their nose cameras. This is a drone, that, a, a Russian military drone that apparently costs like $80,000. Which is nothing, by the way. Like I know, it's a cheap one. <laughs> that's, that's really cheap. That's like, I, I think I think cars are more dollars uh, per copy. This is, this is it, the breakdown, uh, Ukraine uh, soldier. The funny thing is, uh, it, a number of people said this is really not so different from the radio-controlled hobbyist drones you might see people have built. There was even like a bottle cap used as a dial glued in. Um, I guess if you don't open it up, you don't know how unimpressive the technology is. Well, I mean, it, again, it's it. A, a lot of it has to do with um, you know just our little recon. Just, just our little recon drones are like thirty five thousand each, and these are like do nothing. Like they're like tiny little, yeah, like little, yeah. little cute little, and a little bigger than that. Uh, but like once you start talking about you know reapers and so on and so forth, you're talking about you know t tens or hundreds of million reapers and global hawks are like tens or hundreds of millions of Alex, dollars that we put into this. I, I keep uh, doing stories about how uh, it's Turkey that supplies everybody with drones. Like. So what is Turkey done? Like, how come they're like the the go to source for drone folks all around? Because the they, right I now? I don't know actually why why Turkey is except that they probably mm -hmm. decided that they make it a business. Like that, you know, like it's mm -hmm. they, you know they're willing to give you military grade drones. You know, the United States frowns on that. In the United States, you know, we don't we have it's really hard unless you're the United States military. There's a real concern of people weaponizing the drones, and so. It's not a great place to do that, um, and uh, I'm sure they'd China, love to use you know. DJI, but they're from China, right? So that's not another yeah. probably place you're not going to go. Well, and and I think China stayed away. I mean, they they have their own military with their own drones, but I think that most countries that have drones don't want to pro proliferate that because really there is a future where the, I mean, if you see even just the effectiveness that the Ukrainian military has had with some of the drones that they that they got from um, from us and some of the drones that they got from from uh, Turkey is that uh, that they um, they're able to you know kill tanks you know with these drones they drop I mean, they drop munitions on these tanks yeah and so and, and again the other problem is is that when you start if you're getting good at drones you start building like actually capable ones you've got a lot of electronics in there and the drone is going to get shot down right and you don't want to give it up you know, you don't, you know, like the United States doesn't want to have their drone, you know, they'll send people in to go get those, you know, because they don't, they have a bunch of stuff in them that they don't want to, they don't want other people to copy, you know, because drones are very, very, it's a very disruptive technology. There is a, I worked at an A-Life, um, uh, an A-Life company in the early nineties that, you know, could, it could learn like it had an, or, it was a, you know, comp computing organism that could learn. And we ended up putting in a little game, <laughs> but, but it was, but the military wanted to spend a lot of money on it. And like the owners, the founders wouldn't sell it to them. Um, but what they were talking about was firing missile, firing many, many, many small missiles. And as you shoot them down, they're figuring out how to get around you. Like, you know, so you just, you just shoot, you just fire lots of them. You have to shoot them down. They're big enough. And then the missiles just keep getting bigger as, as the, as they start to learn, you know, what your defenses are. And that was 30 years ago. <laughs> like so, so, so it's so the the thing is is that there's a, there's a, a capability of, of using these drones, and if you have a lot of them, even if they're small, that you can't ignore them, and as you shoot at them, you are telling you you are you are giving away your position, and so um, we we're seeing a little bit of that here, um, but we you know definitely uh, that was pretty used pretty heavily in Afghanistan. I do so. worry every time Vladimir Putin. Um, 
tries to um, dissuade the West from getting involved by saying that we're running the risk of, of bringing on scenarios that you know we've never known in the past, whether he's talking about theoretically devastating cyber attacks. Uh, of course, he might also just be talking about nuclear attacks, but... Uh, He'd like to keep it vague just in case. But I wonder if he right. is saving his powder for uh, yeah. a, a I, scenario I, I, like that. I think the only thing he has is nukes. <laughs> like the only thing he has, I mean, he has lots of devastating stuff, but I mean, the only thing he has that's decisive are nukes. You know, I think that, I mean, he may be able to do some cyber attack, but I'm, I'm pretty, I feel very confident the United States could probably shut most of Russia's infrastructure down if they wanted to. They just aren't going to do it unless they have to. Our, our, we've, we've been very careful not to uh, show any cards. You got to be careful. About what we know and what we have. You got to but, but, be but, very but, careful. But, but of knowing what we have and what we could do, there's yeah. no reason to do it until you have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if they shut down our infrastructure, we'd probably do the same thing. The Absolutely. other thing you have, the, the other thing is, is the, the China, Russia, we spend a lot of time trying not to shoot the nu nukes. There's a rumor that, of course, Russia has the dead switch. You know, like so, right. so if, if you shut everything down, it just starts firing nukes. Right. You know, so. Right. Ah, oh, what a world we live in, huh? Uh, let's see. California is banning uh, gas cars. That'll be interesting. At least they're proposing it. Uh, the governor of California some months ago said we should get rid of uh, gas vehicles by 2035, a scant 13 years from now. Now California's Clean Air Resources Board has unveiled its plan to phase out gas-powered vehicles. Uh, there will be a 45-day public comment period. That should be fascinating. <laughs> Uh, a June 9th public hearing. I hope they stream that. That'll be fun to watch. And a vote in uh, August. It phases it out, and it just means that new car sales will have to be uh, electric, not or, or zero emission, I should say. Uh, not necessarily electric. And uh, that used cars can continue to be gas cars. And, of course, they're not going to take your car off the road if it's a gas guzzler. What do you think? Is this uh, it seems like something we should do, we might need to do. Is it doable? Also, well, I how think much it's of funny that they have on the rest of the country, given how. Well, obviously, Cal California's got to be a big market. California has right? done so much in the past to shape yeah. um, what. Our emissions standards changed America's totally. emission standards, yeah. Um, so this might be a big deal just in general. I, I just market. think it's interesting. They took, they took, they're setting up regulations, but they, they're taking away a lot of our incentives, you know, they, or they took a lot of them away. So how much off you get for buying an electric car, and most importantly, the sticker for the hub lane. <laughs> that for a long time, I was looking they at. They took away the sticker? You don't get the sticker all the time. It was a oh. certain number. Of oh yeah, they of only issue a certain a number every year. Yeah, yeah, that's I think, right. I think that like I'm th you can encourage people to just do it because the hub lane is very valuable, more valuable than money to me. Yeah, <laughs> like so it's yeah yeah the yeah. high occupancy vehicle, aka electric yeah. vehicle. Yeah, I see a lot yeah. of cars with those stickers. I don't have them on mine. I know because they they, they stop. Yeah, they stopped issuing them. They had to be a certain kind and everything else. Right, and so, right. but but I think that that was a. I, I know I was looking at. It. I'm still. I've still decided I'm not buying another car until I buy electric because I just. I just don't like going to the gas station. It has nothing. That's, that's the. I just. I like love it. Process. I haven't been to the gas station in a long time. Although you know we had Lisa's car. Uh, she has an electric mini, in for, mm -hmm. in the shop again, and uh, so she, they gave her a, a gas loaner, and I had to drive it down to pick up the car, and I forgot how. I've seen, you poor people. <laughs> yeah, no. You push well, on the uh, pedal and it goes, okay, I think I can go faster. Electric well, the, car, it's like that. I, my neighbor has two Teslas, a Tesla roof, and two Tesla batteries. And um, and he has a totally, light, you know, it's totally closed system. <laughs> yeah, so just, no, we have big uh, solar panels. Yeah. We have the Tesla power walls, electric, all electric yeah. vehicles. It's nice not to go to the gas station. And I don't, you know, honestly, you really want to solve... The, the climate problems and a lot of other problems, you get rid of personal ownership of vehicles entirely. Uh, I hope that day comes at some point because I'm getting older and I'd like to get an Uber for the rest of my life or a self-driving something <laughs> for the rest of my life. It seemed like a good idea. Like I thought about that a lot until until COVID and then after COVID, now I don't want to get so it bad. Yeah, no, right. Yeah. It's like I need I need a car because I can't get anywhere because Uber <laughs> takes a third. Uber takes thirty minutes to get to get uh, to get a. You know. Haven't you heard COVID's over? I wonder. Well, um, it's just that everyone left and didn't come back. Electric yeah. car will cost by 2035 because there are so many people who cost is a big factor. And I mean, I'm not even sure how much a decent 
used electric car costs at the moment, but right. it's not within the reach of everybody who needs transportation. Although with gas prices, uh, in, at least in California, hitting five bucks, uh, electric cars starting to look maybe a five. little bit where can more you get, appealing. Where can you get gas in California for five dollars? What is it now? I, I want to know. Six, oh, it's in the six dollars. It's, it's over six dollars. Yeah, I just filled up a couple days ago. I was like, what the what? Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> you see, and I don't, I don't know do what the price often. of milk is either. I just uh, I live yeah. in a in a different world. Um, yeah. Wow, I didn't realize it was six. Yeah, so that's got to make this. In fact, maybe Carb waited until gas was six bucks a gallon in California, right. and then they thought now would be a good time. Let's try it. But you know, people are going to freak out. Well, the problem is, is that if in California has to fix its electrical system before they That's take away the gas cars. That's a real big problem. Because, I agree, hundred percent. We all have everywhere I live now. When, when the electricity goes out, we're all prepared now. We all have generators. You hear all these, yeah. these, these gas generators all turning on mm. all the way through the through the through the hills. Unless you, know, just, you get the new Ford F one fifty Lightning. One of the selling points is when the power goes out. And you might have seen these ads. You plug your truck into the house, and then the truck runs the house, which I think is a good idea. For how long? I guess. Yeah, especially. well, it's a pretty big battery. It might might get you might get you through the night. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else. Muting your mic. This is an interesting story. We won't know the real story until this uh, report comes out. The University of Washington, oh, I'm sorry, University of Wisconsin Madison uh, tested quote many popular apps to see if the video conferencing apps continue to capture audio when you press the mute button, and apparently many of them do. We won't know which until the 2022 Privacy Enhancing Technologies Symposium. That's when the paper will be published this June. But the uh, report says all of the apps they tested occasionally gather raw audio data while mute is activated. One popular app, I'm, gonna, I'm pretty sure it's Zoom. I'm just going to say, because Zoom's had this problem before, Continue to gather data to the audio to its server at the same rate, regardless of whether the microphone is muted or not. Now, Alex, you're a Zoom expert. This does not surprise me. That mute button on Zoom is mostly just a saying, don't send my audio to everybody in the conference. Yeah, I, I will say that, I, you know, it may inadvertently do that. I, I can tell, I, I will say that Zoom worries about, I mean, especially after what happened in 2020, Security is really important to them, you know, so I think that if they see something like that, it's probably, a, a, you know, a, a very, very big, serious thing for them to get rid of. You know, yeah. it, I don't know if it's a, it's a very popular. There are we don't know a bunch of very popular ones that are less te technologically advanced than Zoom. So if you look at WebEx and GoToMeeting and Meet and Teams and, uh, you know, I, I, to be honest with you, I'd, I'd be more likely to think it was Teams than, than Zoom um, because, I mean, Zoom has got a laser focus. Teams is very complicated. It's just a, it's connected to a lot of things. Um, uh, Zoom is focused on one one thing. And the security now in Zoom, if you turn all the dials up, it's pretty secure. You know, like it's... Hey, and so you can inadvertently you wanna... open it all the time, though. That's the problem is that it's, you know, I have a physical mute right here. Yeah, that's the thing. I think that's a if if you're going to take a moral from this article is get a physical mute button. Or maybe it's yeah, just like but also what, the what he was just level. saying is is you you'd want to you'd worry more about a company that's focused on things like AI and things like that because like what does Zoom care about your audio? They they don't have other business lines that they're going to turn that into something else at least that we know of. Right. But a Google might, a, you know, a Microsoft might be using that to to train data sets and things like that. Good point. Yeah, yeah, it's it it uh, yeah. I think that I think that it's it's it, we see a lot of people in off, office hours. Of course, is all in Zoom, and so we have a lot of people inadvertently muting themselves or unmuting themselves. One of the most popular things in any Zoom meeting is we can't hear you. You know, yeah, you're muted. And so so the you know so it's and uh, so inadvertently turning it on and off is a pretty common thing. Uh, I think that they're not. I, I think that and I think that most of these companies. I mean, I, it's it it definitely could be a problem. I think most of these companies are, um, they, they consider holding on to that information without telling you to be a hot potato. You know, like that's not something that they, that they really want because they know it'll, the, the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of kryptonite there. So the, the other thing you'll notice if you, if, you, if you've seen pictures sometimes of um, some business leaders, you'll notice that they have a headphone jack, a little thing that pops in their headphone jack that tells it it's a headphone, but there's no mic to it. And they have their, their uh, uh, usually their webcam taped off. Almost all of us do that have worked in this thing. Yeah. So mine's off. You know, I have a, yeah. I have another camera, and mine's, I my webcams all get taped, and then I get, and then, um, 
And, and even like, if you look at Apple, if you do anything that asks for permission of that webcam, like to, to, to talk to it, like webcam settings or whatever, it you have to restart up. your computer to yeah. use it. Like yeah. it's just, Apple just immediately turns it off. So, yeah. so I think that there's, there's a, a lot of sensitivity to it. Um, but, but even then you, you, again, you have business leaders and world leaders that will put things into it to make it, to fool the hardware to not take anything in. You know, I have a little physical, this is a Lenovo, has a little physical switch that I can see yeah, those are nice. mechanically going over the camera. My framework laptop has that. Mm -hmm. um, the microphone's more problematic. There's, you know, you'd have to trust it that it's cutting off the microphone. And again, that's why I have, I mean, I do it for convenience because I, I turn mine on, on and off all the time. Like yeah. I, you know, because yeah. the, again, because of this mic, I'm constantly turning it off so I can like take a sip of tea or whatever. Right, so it's, right. How about this? Companies are starting to use AI to monitor your mood during sales calls. This is a new kind of AI software that detects emotion. Companies like Unifor and Sybil, good name, are building products that use AI. Zoom wants to do this as well. They've announced their plans to do this in the future to analyze the voice, people's moods, their body language during a call to know if, you know, are they interested? Are they going to buy? Are they not going to buy? Sitting alongside someone's image on a camera during a virtual meeting, the cue for sales application visualizes emotion through a fluctuating gauge you can see, indicating detected levels of sentiment and engagement, kind of like those cue dials TV companies use to measure your popularity, based on the system's combined interpretation of their satisfaction, happiness, engagement, surprise, anger, disgust, fear, or sadness. Now, the good news is you have to turn on this video call as being recorded. So that would be a, a protection against that. What do you think? It's like a lie detector built into software, Harry. I mean, at first blush, it feels like it should pretty much be like a no-go zone. Yeah. Uh, particularly if this is something that um, the people doing the selling can do to us and we have no ability to, to uh, do the same thing to see how they're feeling and if we might be able to cut a deal or whatever. Um, I th yeah, I, th I think that uh, particularly if it's being done without us knowing specifically that this is being done rather than just we're being recorded, it just it sounds terrible. The, Z the Zoom one sounds slightly less bad because it's not real time. Um, they're taking video afterwards and, and in aggregate analyzing it, which I also don't like, but it's, it's not quite as terrifying. It integrates into Salesforce. You're going to have to have new uh, Salesforce I mean, I just uh, think of, settings. I think about something like buying a car where you, you know all a lot forever when people have been trying to sell you a car, they're trying to read you and trying to figure out. Well, that's the problem. You can't uh, read that body language right. on a Zoom call very well. Right. Like, right? you know, is this person going to walk if I don't um, give them a better price? <laughs> the idea they might use technology to gauge that is, that is awful. A product from Cogito, this is from an article in Protocol, uses in-call voice analysis to analyze the emotional state of callers or service reps during customer service calls. An alert, as an example shown, says, frustration detected, show empathy. <laughs> the hard part is, is when people do this kind of like uh, sales by numbers, it usually comes across, because um, the people who use it are usually yes. people who are not very em empathetic. So they're, they're not very good at it. So that's why they're, that's why you're turning on the autopilot is because you're, you don't yeah, know how to do it If they were good, yourself. they wouldn't need it. Yeah. We, exactly. already, and, we already have all these people who are, you know, when you call a um, service provider, they spend too much time telling you how much they care about your problem oh, and how invested they are in solving it for you. <laughs> Just which, solve it, which, please. Which, which has nothing to do with them actually solving right. it. Uh, right. Right. Yeah, I agree. I, let's add this to podcasting, though, Brian. Wouldn't that be useful if you had a little button? Boredom detected. Show empathy. Well, there's a lot of areas in my life when uh, <laughs> people not caring what I say or, or what I'm talking about, I'd like to know that. Um, but, uh, you know, you can always, any any system like this, uh, it, they already have that for, you know, the, the calls to customer service because, you know, um, dropping f bombs and things like that, <laughs> or saying manager, manager, manager. Like you know, they already have the escalation stuff in terms of like um, you know, just does that for work? If you go manager, 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 I saw a it's video a couple of times for me. That. It works. You use I usually it. say representative. I usually just go. Repre I pick it up yeah. as soon as I hear a computer. I'm like representative, representative, representative. representative, representative, yeah. representative. <laughs> just, just keep or saying just it until someone shows. Push up. zero until something. <laughs> something yeah. Yeah. Operator, operator. All right. I mean, the thing is, is that we've been doing this for. I mean, I know for the last twenty years. 
we've had eye tracking, which you do eye tracking against random samples. Yeah. And we did some 10 years ago and it was the probably, it was, you know, you think you know what you're doing and then you do eye tracking and it just devastated us. Like it was like all of the information that we thought we had, like for instance, if you talk for, if, you, if you're in a presentation with someone, we did this with, with folks watching a, a stream, we were doing live streaming tests. If, if they, uh, we found out that if, they, if we talk for more than five to six minutes straight, in it to, you know, as a sales call, uh, they stop, they stop actively listening. <laughs> like they're just looking, they're doing something else. And, and if we put a slide up, this is, this is the worst one. If you put a slide up, you have 60 to 90 seconds before they stop listening to you. Wow. And, and it's like, and, and, and every time I see people putting up presentation slides, I'm, I'm the, you know, we have all this data that we generated from it and, uh, we just go, Oh, they're not going to. And I noticed myself doing it. I, if someone puts up a slide in a presentation for more than 60, 90 seconds. I'm checking my email. I'm, I'm looking at other things. And I didn't think about it until I did that. And I realized I do that in person too. I mean, like if I'm at a seminar, <laughs> if you put the slide up too long, I'll start doing other things. But it was, it was really interesting. That data was super valuable. And we do that. We did that all through the aughts, you know, with, um, ads, you know, print ads, websites, the design of websites, we would look at, you get 200 random samples in there and you have random people. And it turns out they, the lower brain does a lot of things really fast. You could put an ad at a certain place in a page and no one would even see it. And so, you know, that you just learn where, you know, if there's certain colors and certain things, the brain, the, the eyes are going to go where they're, you know, they're going to go a certain way. And very few people will vary from that. And, and so, um, but so it was used in web design, ad design, video ad design, you know, it's, there's a lot of, um, you know, eye tracking is a, is a real thing. And that not as a certain person, because it turns out you don't need to, the eye tracking is pretty, uh, you know, certain designs and colors and objects will, will take the lower brain and just have it look at things, you know? And so you just got to figure out what that is. So you're so gaming it's, it's, it. That's what you're doing. You're gaming the eye tracking. Look at me, look oh, at me, look at me. Oh, look at what I want you to look at. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, filmmakers have been doing that for a century. Yeah, you know, I'm going to do, right. yeah. I'm going to, Take this stuff out of focus. Yeah. Like yeah. when we, when I worked in film, we we would take things, we would take objects out of the background to make sure that you didn't, that you were Get always distracted. watching. Yeah, yeah. You know, or put them back in because we want you to look over there. Yeah. But you know, so the, it's, but but before it was all guessing, and then it became in like now the early two thousands, it yeah. became like a an application that would do it. And now it used to be, it used to be a, a piece of hardware we used to we used to use for that, and then it just became you know now you can get it you know with a webcam. I know how to get people's attention back. I. A cute, fuzzy dog picture will do it. This yes, tweet just always. in from Elon Musk. Happy Easter. Now, the problem with poor Elon now, he can't just post a picture of a dog in a bunny outfit with Easter eggs before somebody says, well, wait a minute, isn't that a Shiba Inu? Is he promoting Dogecoin? What's going on? But actually, that's his Shiba Inu, Floki. And uh, I don't know what's inside those eggs. It does look a little bit like some sort of crypto, but, well, we'll never know. So happy Easter, everybody. Happy Passover. Ramadan also. Uh, we are going to have more in just a moment. I can watch your eyes glazing over right now as I say <laughs> it's time for a commercial. <laughs> Thank you, Alex Lindsay, Brian McCullough, and Mr. Harry McCracken for being here. Thank you for being here. Our, show, our 17th anniversary episode, no cupcakes, no balloons, because it's a prime number. We don't celebrate on prime number holidays. Uh, this Week in Tech brought to you today by Zip Recruiter. You know, there is a good trend in, employ in employment these days. Employers are desperate to get you back to work into the office. So according to research from Zip Recruiter, 90% of employers are making enhancing your experience as an employee a top priority this year. We even did it. We, we've, we've, uh, we have now four-day work weeks for all of our employees. Uh, you can make your employees happier by considering their opinion. What a, what a thought. Focusing on company culture. Offering more learning opportunities. Allow for flexibility in work schedules. Show more empathy. Make time to connect. After all, a happy workplace is key to attracting and keeping great employees. And when you need to add more employees to your team, don't forget ZipRecruiter. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter free at ziprecruiter.com slash twit. It's what we use when we need to hire. And I have to say, it really works for a number of reasons. You post to the broadest possible audience. That's fantastic. And ZipRecruiter's technology actually finds the right candidates for your job and then proactively presents them to you. So you, you post your job and ZipRecruiter within minutes is going to say, hey, there's 10 people uh, we have 
who I know would be great for you. Would you be interested in asking them? And you can easily review those candidates, invite the top choices to apply. And by the way, when you get invited to apply for a job, you apply faster, you're more likely to take that job. You just feel better about that employer. It really works. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site in the U.S. based on G2 ratings. I want you to try it. We've had such great success. Some of our best employees came to us through ZipRecruiter. Hire the right employees with ZipRecruiter. Try it free. Our exclusive address, ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter, Z-I-P-R-E-C-R-U-I-T-E-R, ZipRecruiter.com slash T-W-I-T. Thank you, ZipRecruiter, for supporting uh, twit. Thank you for supporting it by uh, using that very special address, ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Uh, let's see. It's kind of was a was it a slow week, Brian? Do you notice when weeks are slow? You have to do news every day. Uh, yeah, and those are the worst days because those are the days that it takes me the longest to put a show together. Yeah, um, our longest shows that. are when there's nothing to say for some reason. Alex will <laughs> Alex will vouch for that on Mac Break Weekly. Yeah, we just we we get we we just go into the rat hole and then end up in a rat cave and yeah, keeps on going. Away. Um, I was gonna bring up. I'm just going through some of the some of the stories. It's kind of it's kind of all a potpourri right now. Bunch of different little tidbits. TikTok launching its own AR development platform. Do we need AR on TikTok? I think mm. not. <laughs> well, they already have a lot of effects. I mean, TikTok already has a lot of video effects they've already been doing, and people use it as part of their kind of narratives when they when they build videos. It's called Effect House. It would allow creators to build AR effects for use in the video. It's officially live now. Oh, I didn't. I misread that. So, the, so if they're if it's if it's actually letting developers do it, then it's more exciting because they. Can oh, actually wouldn't that be cool? Maybe yeah. I'll, so they're not just stuck what with what Snap they have. is doing. Now. Create your own filters and even mm -hmm. maybe sell them. Right. Yeah. Most people yeah, do. Want... I think. Oh, good. Oh, I was going to say, I was, I was moving on. Like, do you want to do that? Um, I found that whole um, piece about uh, Meta's uh, AR and VR. As long as we're talking AR. Timetable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, uh, this is from The Verge. Mark Zuckerberg's augmented reality. Uh, I don't, I'm actually curious what you all think. Is, Me is this Meta saying, yeah, this Facebook thing is not working out. So let's get this AR thing going as fast as possible. According to Alex Heath writing for The Verge, Meta's racing to release his first AR glasses in 2024. That isn't that fast a pivot, I guess, maybe in the greater scheme of things, two years. Is well, in theory, Apple's whatever headset yeah. would at least be might announced be before. This then. year. Yeah, it might, might yeah. even be this year. Yeah. But I mean, I mean they I are. They, we we know they're spending ten billion dollars a year, and there's twenty thousand employees on this um, team for geez. whatever the metaverse team is. You know, so it I, certainly sounds like this is the real deal in in Zuck's mind. Anna, this is uh, from Heath again. Animating the push for AR and Facebook's rebranding is a desire by Zuckerberg to cast the company he found as innovative once again. People familiar with his thinking say i.e. insiders. The social network's reputation has been stained by a series of privacy and content moderation scandals, which has been hurting employee morale and faith in leadership. So if you read that whole piece... Oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Brian. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and I, I'll, I'll stop because I keep cutting you off, <laughs> Alex. I apologize. No, no, no. Sorry. It's, if you it's just Zoom. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you read that whole piece, <laughs> it is... Yeah, it, it, it sort of is making the same argument that we've heard people put into Apple's mouth about how they believe that th there's a line in there that Zuck wants this to be his iPhone moment, that they really do believe by the end of the decade that they can be selling hundreds of millions of these uh, a year or whatever. So, you know, obviously Meta's overarching motivation for this is to get out from under the thumb of Google and Apple um, but it is interesting. What I found fascinating about the piece is it, laying out the timeline where, you know, they'll, they'll have a really high end one at the beginning. 2024 is what they're claiming. And then iteration, iteration, iteration. And it's not till 2028 and into the next decade that they're feeling like, OK, now this will be mass adoption. So if you're meta, if you're a meta investor, 
and they're spending $10 billion a year on this already now, you're look at all, all the time and money and effort. You, you better hope that they're right at the end of the decade that this is the next big thing. It's bold. I mean, if you had three and a half billion users and you were raking in money with advertising, even with Apple's, you know, uh, ATT, you're still making a ton of money in advertising. It's pretty bold to say, yeah, we're going to abandon this successful business and put all our money on, the, you know, all our chips on something that is unproven, that no one has really shown there's even a market for, let alone uh, a successful business behind. The Verge uh, piece is great. And I actually yesterday wrote a piece uh, spinning out of what Alex Heath did specifically about this idea that uh, this is Meta wanting to create a... a um, iPhone moment. A, the next big thing. A, there have hardly been any iPhone moments other than the iPhone yeah. in tech history. <laughs> yeah. uh, B, um, it, this really speaks to something deep, I think, in, in Mark Zuckerberg, which is not just me psychoanalyzing him. It's also based on the fact that in 2015, I did a big story on what was then Facebook. And he told me that like one of his few disappointments was that um, Facebook never got to have its own mobile operating system. Uh, an operating system. Yes. Um, so it like always the Facebook sat, phone. Facebook always sat as a layer on top of yeah. the iPhone or um, an Android phone. And um, so, as yeah. successful as Facebook is, it is not successful enough to match Mark's ambition. Right. And also, um, the problems with it not controlling an operating system really came to fore um, last year when Apple rolled out the um, application tra tracking transparency which lets the user say, yes, it's okay for this app to track me, or right. no, they're not allowed to track me. And then uh, you know, uh, Meta says it's going to lose billions and billions of dollars this year because Apple has made it extremely easy for users yeah. not 10 to billion be, this year and at least that much Meta. next year. So, yeah. um, back in 2015, his concerns were extremely reasonable from his standpoint, and, and uh, the downside of not controlling your own platform is still playing out for them. And um, there's a pretty decent chance that if AR does become something big, it will become a battle between whatever Apple comes up with and whatever Meta comes up with. And if you were Mark Zuckerberg, wouldn't you be deeply concerned by the possibility that, that Apple will have the iPhone moment of AR and he might be stuck in the same situation he, he has been all, all these years of, of having to do things the way Apple wants him to do them? I th it's right. extremely bold. He, you know, obviously he's a smart fella. He knows about the innovator's dilemma. And normally a company like Meta would rest on its laurels and try to kind of dribble out something that might be your next thing, but still continue to support the current thing. He sounds like he's saying, I'm going to cut through that and I am going to take a massive gamble. I'm going all in on AR, even though it's going to take me years, 10 billion a year, 18,000 employees. And it's an Not unproven... Not just AR, remember, this is the whole metaverse. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're giving it short shrift by just saying AR. Remember that. Well, but the primary well, technology that has to work is is AR, VR, right? If that doesn't I work, agree, you, you got nothing. Yeah. It, it's a, you it's got a really hard life. problem. It's also a really hard problem. I mean, I, I, I think that, that uh, Zuckerberg's um, uh, history with this is probably... Is, Related to reading Ready Player One, <laughs> and <laughs> well, remember though he I, bought Oculus so, Rift for a lot of money. He bought Oculus, right? But I'm saying he he, he read Ready Player One. I think he saw. I I, I think that he has. Uh, he may have seen a future that Facebook could really be part of. You know, like that that it's an all encompassing experience, a, a different world. Um, and then bought Oculus because it's the closest thing to what was going on. And. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a really hard problem to. A lot of it has to do with. There's a bunch of problems. With it. I, I worked, and in full disclosure, I mean, I I did a lot of the initial uh, 360 video stuff for Facebook. So so I'm, I'm I thought about this a lot. And um, the uh, the thing is, is that the 360 video. I mean, that, that's when we were doing. You know, that that Ozo that I brought to your house, yeah. <laughs> to, to your office. Yeah. That's when I was doing. We were doing a lot of the early stuff um, in that area. And the hard part, the first really hard part is, is resolution, resolution and frame rate. So you have to get that resolution and it takes an enormous amount of data to do that well. Um, you know, so we were playing with 4K 30, but you really need to get to 8K 120 to really have it do what it needs to do. And that would require a lot of chip, like an M1 chip <laughs> just to do that, you know? And so, um, so anyway, so it's, it's a, it's to a do difficult that on your problem. Head. 
to do that on your head and probably it'd be very hard. But it and, does kind of explain why Apple's gone all in on this low power, high efficiency yeah, chip. It makes a right? lot of sense. Yeah. You, yeah. You and need so that if you're going to make a, a visor work. The, this, Alex, the, I, the, I, I did a story recently too that said, and I, I'm breaking my uh, promise not to interrupt you, that, okay, <laughs> even if you saw. No, it's a better show hardware, if we all interrupt each other. Mm -hmm. Trust if, me. If you, yeah, if you, yeah, that's all good. Even if you solve the hardware and the, the compute stuff, um, you know, on the user, um, I did a story, maybe it was a couple months ago, that said someone was pointing out that we don't have the infrastructure um, to beam all of the stuff that is required to do sort of like a really immersive, a really convincing metaverse. Because even if you solve all of the local hardware and compute problems, we don't have it, it's 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 so far beyond what 5G or 8G or anything could do that that even if you solve this problem by the end of the decade, you might not have the infrastructure in place to make it real. Yeah, kind of. I mean, so if you're doing video, absolutely. If you're doing so, if you're if you're taking it, I want to do a servers offsite or whatever, because you really are like if you're doing 8K 120 per eye, you're talking hundreds of megabits per second that need to be delivered to you. But if, but the geometry, if if you send the geometry to it. That doesn't, you know, you can send very high resolution geometry for an entire world, and maybe that takes a little bit of time. But then once it's there, what you need is GPU and CPU power to render it. Um, so if you're rendering it remotely, you're absolutely right. If you're rendering it locally, it doesn't, it can be a lot of geometry that it has to manage, but it might be 30, 40, maybe 100 million polygons or something like that. And you can, you can work inside of that. And then what you do is we, we take um, level, what we call level of detail LODs. And so basically things off in the distance don't have very much geometry. <laughs> things in close to you have a lot of geometry and better textures and all those other things. And so that you can kind of wander around in them. The bigger problem than all of the technical problems is the difference between what people feel, what they think they're, they're experiencing and what they feel that they're experiencing. So there's like a frontal lobe, lower brain problem, which is that if they feel like they're in something that is that is real and then their lower brain says, I'm not getting what I need, the delta between those two is depression. You know, and that's what oh, we see a lot nice. of in, yeah. you know, so, so basically people get their, 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 they're basically filling, uh, their, their, their You're saying VR eating. makes you sad. Well, social media makes you sad. So, so, so the true. thing is you think you're, you think you're in a community, but you're not. And so right. what happens is no, you get depressed yes. because you're fill, you, you keep on going to Twitter and, and Facebook looking for, this is where my friends are going to be. And you keep on pulling it all in, but there's no fulfillment. It's kind of like, you know, the, the easiest way to kill ants is to feed them a Splenda. You just put sugar out and you slowly cut it with Splenda and they can't tell the difference and they just starve to death. And so the, Alex, so the, um, yeah, go ahead. One more thing though. Like, okay, we're, we're talking about like uh, all of this money spent and, and Leo said this is a bold bet. It is a bold bet. And maybe it's something that they have to do because maybe social media is a thing that's on the downturn. But aside from will the technology work out, will it be adopted? Will the infrastructure be there? There's one more big thing is will people want it from Mark Zuckerberg? Like that to me – no, that's is a huge the biggest that's, risk. Yeah, yeah but what choice does this? Mark have? Well, I mean, if he's he you know, is Mark Zuckerberg, he is Mark Zuckerberg, so he can't really, right. you know. But, I mean, I think he actually this worst. may be you. It, it, Alex Heath makes a very good argument for this being the boldest bet we've ever seen in technology. It's huge. Apple, right. with all of its investment in AR, and they're all in on it, is still selling the iPhone. That's still their main business. This is this is really a, I think, unprecedented. Willingness to take a giant risk, and I have to praise Zuckerberg for that. And yeah, he's stuck with himself. There's but, nothing he could do about it. He's got to be well, hoping the, that people will is, get that over that. If it's a, when you I'll tell you what. If it's a good enough technology, if it's really good, people will get over that. Don't although you think? Oculus is an interesting case study because, um, you know, by any standard, it is the dominant VR platform. Quest, the Quest right um, now is number one. They've by sold far. a lot. They have seventy eight percent of the market. Yeah, it's done really well. And yet it hasn't really had an iPhone moment if um, if that means that like practically everybody has one. Uh, VR is still really far from that, um, despite all There's the There's also a problem with it. the Quest, which is that it's at a price point of two ninety nine, and right. It's going to be very hard for him to create something anywhere near that they're, price point. They're putting some incredibly pricey technology in, into these AR headsets. So. Yeah, I think that the other issue is just content is hard to make. Like, it, there's not that many compelling tool, things to do. I have a Quest, of course, and and I there's just not that much to play. And then the other big problem for the Quest, this is a, this is a, a really interesting problem, is the Quest doesn't have a diopter. You can't change the focus on it, right? And the Sam, the old Samsung Gears did. 
a lot of us that would use the Quest wear glasses. <laughs> like so, so the problem is, is that you have to either ruin your glasses or you have to get the the special things for them to, you know, the the lenses for them to to work, and then someone else has to pop out other lenses. The ability to not. I stopped using it. Like my kids use it. I just was like, I'm tired of dealing with this. And so, um, so the, uh, so I barely use the quest and, but I think that there's, there's a huge crossover of, of geeks and glasses, you know? And so, so I think that they, that's something they're kind of running up against. It'll be interesting to see how people handle it. Cause I know that I use the, I, I would always prefer to use the gear because I could take my glasses off, throw it on and just scroll a little wheel until everything was in focus. My glasses and, um, don't fit inside um, the quest too. Yeah. Not, yeah, not comfortably, you know, and, and if you have nice glasses, it'll destroy them. Like it just destroys their glasses slowly, your, your glasses slowly. So you have to put the lenses in or you have to destroy, have a glass, basically cheap glasses you buy out of, you know, some online thing that you but wear. this just is for the one class. of dozens of problems with a VR. It yeah, makes people nauseous, not the least of which. Well, so how are we going to overcome a, all that? Well, the 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 uh, yeah the not the not just that, but that's again why uh, I think Apple is probably spending more time. Apple has a tendency to be a lot more methodical <laughs> about the process, and so uh, and, and they're I mean the well, I clearly what I Facebook's know, plan is just to throw as much money and man manpower know, against it, and I don't think having eighteen thousand people working on it is going to give you any head start compared right. to anybody else. It might hurt, but you have it might hurt. But like you see, a lot of the upgrades that Apple's doing to Final Cut and Motion are not for video; they are for AR and VR. Yeah, you know, they're three hundred and sixty solutions, and they're they're building those. Well, things Apple's in, doing know. an incremental thing, which is very interesting, right? Everything Apple does is building yeah. towards. It looks like building towards this kind of a future. I guess you could kind of say with the acquisition of Oculus, uh, with the release of the Facebook Ray Ban glasses, with the release of the Quest, Apple. I mean, Mike uh, Meta is slowly moving in that direction, but not, it doesn't feel like the same kind of incrementalism as Apple. Apple has a different but, approach to this. They're well, not betting the farm on this. The Ray Bans the, apparently Alex, it did not sell as well as uh, uh, what a anybody surprise. expected. Uh, yeah, I mean the marketplace Alex, has said, said again and again, we don't want this. I think. Well, what Alex said about content is actually the key because they don't need an iPhone moment; they need a Fortnite moment. Like uh, they need a they need something like, like that. that that is a yeah. real phenomenon. killer app. A killer app, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. And, not and, reinventing and, the wheel. Yeah, yeah. And what's funny is the killer app before before this was still from Epic Games. It was Robo Recall. Robo Recall is probably still one of the best games that was built for Oculus, and it was really immersive and really fun to play. And uh, they haven't really reproduced that again. You know, like it was like okay, once you beat it, you it's kind of like okay, now what do I do? But because you go out and play other games, and they just weren't as good. And so, and they commissioned that. I mean, Oculus commissioned that from from Epic or whatever. And so, so it was a great. It was basically a first person shooter with robots um, and. Uh, really, really, really well-made game. Um, so, and so, yeah, go ahead. When uh, we celebrate our 27th anniversary doing Twit 10 years from now, Brian, what's your prediction? Will AR from Meta be the hot new thing? Will we be doing this show in a Metaverse? What's the date you're saying? Oh, I don't know, 10 years out. You can you yeah, can okay. choose an arbitrary year. 20, 2032. Okay, um, yeah. Um, Which sounds like the be, future, but as we know, it'll be here any minute. <laughs> okay, so let's imagine that instead of us being on screens, we're all sitting around a table, and then every listener slash viewer is seated at a yes. chair with us so yes. they can look around at our face. Okay. I love that. Is that going to be real 10 years from now? Yeah, I don't know. Is it? It's... I, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. But Alex would know better than me, and certainly Harry maybe has. We do, well, there's a, we don't know if the technology's there. We don't know if it'll be Facebook doing it. We don't know. There's a lot we don't know. It, but predictions. The, the, wor the, the worst part is is that um, it's much hard. It'll get it'll get worse before it gets better because right now nothing looks real. When we get to the uncanny valley, it's going to be ugly. You know, like it's going to be that un uncanny valley is really hard to get through. ILM with millions and millions of dollars still can't do Princess Leia. And that's not in real time. That's well, but just in, in all of the, uh, I think Facebook knows this or Meta knows this because in all of their samples, the people are kind of ghostly. They're faded out to avoid they, that uncanny valley experience. Is, but they don't have you, legs. You know, they, you, it's very clear they're not right. trying to be human. Maybe we'll have is, cartoon is that, avatars. It is, but the problem is, is that there is so much that goes on in our, I mean, as someone who's, I've done, you know, hours and hours of facial animation for projects. There is so much a human face does <laughs> that is so complex. And, and I think that the problem is when you don't have all of that, 
information, it's kind of soul sucking, you know, to always be looking at something that is a rough facsimile of the real thing. It's part of why I think people get Zoom fatigue is because they yeah. don't have good cameras, they don't have good yeah. audio. So they're looking at these hazy faces and their brain is doing, there's all this cognitive load of the brain sitting there trying to figure out what it's looking at and what it's hearing because people have bad cool. audio and bad video. We on office hours, we stay on for hours. It doesn't bother us at all because everybody's got a good mic and a good camera. So, Alex, so also, the thing is, is that, go ahead. How, how do you solve the problem of, you know, I think Zuck's sort of killer app is you put it on and you can talk to grandma and it feels like grandma is sitting in on the couch across from you. I kind of have that you, with FaceTime right now. But but how would you map grandma's face? I know that all of these cameras have like like if we did if we did Leo's thing for 10 years from now, we could be have, you know, studios and, and cameras pointed at us. And I know that that all sorts of these headsets now have outward facing cameras and all these things. And but. Like, how do you solve the problem of if I'm really going, the, the uncanny valley of if I'm really going to feel like I'm talking to grandma sitting across from me, how do you map what her face is doing in real time if she's got a headset on? You're making assumptions based on what you're seeing the rest of the face and it won't be accurate and it'll feel mm. really weird. It's going to feel really mm. weird. Like it's not going to, you know, and it's going to take a long time to get that right, which is why Apple smartly keeps on talking about AR because AR is adding things to the world that you already have. It's not. Well, how long know, does, trying to replace uh, Harry, it. how long does Meta have? They, do they have 10 years? That's a, if they're spending that much money every year. Well, theoretically, they have a really long <laughs> runway because they? Um, they are have historically gushed money, but um, they can't be sure that will go on forever. Um, if, if their conventional business starts to collapse... Um, they might have a much more limited ability. Do they to have ten years? New stuff. I mean, I still really feel like it, if uh, if this kind of AR and the metaverse really is real in the 2030s, and we're sitting around talking about it, it's there's a very high chance the companies we'll, we'll be talking about are not Meta, not really meta. or Apple or any, yeah. or even any company that exists right now. Yeah. Historically, it's it's been pretty rare for the, the tech industry to work that way. Uh, Apple has been like one of the the few really big exceptions that they've they've been able to ride more than one wave. Um, there's not would not be a lot of precedent if uh, if Meta can go from social networking in its historic form right. to the kind of stuff we're talking about now. And I can assure you, Mark Zuckerberg knows everything we've just said. Absolutely, and is still putting his money right out there and saying we're going to do it anyway, and we'll either make it or there will be no Meta in ten years, but we're going to do it. We're going to try. Well, but 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 with his revenue, ten billion dollars a year is not a no. you know it's not putting it's not going all in. It's like one chip off the pile, you know, to 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 do this. And so I think that they can continue to work on a lot of different business models because they've got a lot of revenue coming in. And I don't think that's going to go anywhere. It's the, the social media is a pretty. I mean, Facebook's a pretty sticky thing, um, and even with some of the search stuff not working and costing them some money. It is when you do Facebook advertising, it is like looking into this, both Facebook and Google. It's like looking into the sun. Yeah. I mean, it is, there is so There's much, I mean, no when you, yeah. when, when you have meetings, when you have meetings with folks, they're like, so what's your multiplier? And multiplier is how much, how many dollars do you bring in versus the dollar you put into the Facebook? And it's usually like, you know, three, four, six. Yeah. Eight. We used to say ROI. You know, like it's, now it's multiplier, which will give you some. But it's a multiplier. It's not 30%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it's, you know, it's so, so, so if, you know, if, if you, if you, if you understand how to, you know, and that's why all those, that's why all those tracking bits are important because yep. it shows the effectiveness of the ad. And, you know, it's not trying to track you to do things. It's showing how, how good did the ad do. I'm yeah. glad you brought this up, Brian, because I, I, this is a, I think Alex Heath deserves a lot of credit. He clearly did a ton of research and digging on this. And it is a fascinating story in The Verge, Mark Zuckerberg's augmented reality. And I think it really is a big question. And I, 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 I applaud Zuck's uh, willingness to take a big chance. You're right. It's not going to, I guess it's not make or break for Meta. Feels like it. Feels like the, they're willing to kind of ignore their core business to some extent. To make oh, I don't think happen. they're ignoring it. I mean, yeah. I no, Cheryl's doing that. Business. We got Cheryl. We've got a lot of people She'll working take on care it. of it. <laughs> and, that uh, line that you read, Leo, about um, seeming relevant and attracting talent that's the immediate thing. they need they Whether need to keep the engineers exactly flowing yeah. yeah that's a huge issue isn't it well and that's that's when you've seen the dance with with the google facebook apple all have all is they're dancing around this kind of work from home problem because a lot of the folks that i know that work in those companies they're like if i have to go back to work i'm not going to quit but i am going to make sure my my, my uh, linkedin is really uh shiny Up you know and so yeah 
yeah, up to date and ready to go because it's making them all. The, that seems to be right now the big thing is 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 whether they get to whether they have to go into the office all the time. You know, and that's, that's a fascinating shift in the labor workforce that is yeah. unprecedented. I think, which uh, you know, you can uh, Henry Ford didn't have to fight off, you know. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, engineers who said, hey, you do what we say or we're walking off the, the floor. Uh, well, it's, there's a constrained supply of, of engineers. That's the, that, I mean, that's the real and issue. Is and it's it? a highly, know it. highly skilled occupation, well, it, right? But it's also, it takes years to develop it. That's why you yeah. have things like Grow with Google. It's well, even more like, than that. We need more people faster. Uh, and you know, like I firmly believe, I may be wrong, that there is a small percentage of engineers who can get all that training and still be the top talent. Oh yeah, right. To design a new chip or design an AR headset that's lightweight and works and battery life is all day. That you could train a thousand people and you might only get one or two that are really I, capable of that. Right. I, I feel very certain that if there's all these big companies on the in Fang, there's probably a hundred people that if you pull them out of the company it would collapse. Yeah. Like you know, they, we, yeah. we we tend to, we we refer to them as linchpins. Right. Like, oh, that person's a linchpin. Yeah. <laughs> like, totally like that. That like pay attention to that person because they're a linchpin to the company because it, you, you know they would they a lot of them tend to have very nebulous jobs and they just kind of are, ta are in a lot of teams kind of just gluing things together, and um and and they get a lot of <laughs> they get a lot of stock. <laughs> so so um you know to to the golden the golden handcuffs are very thick. Sometimes you know, they call it and some say it's a myth a ten x programmer at right. developer. Which is why having 18,000 people... Um, well, doesn't mean anything. Yeah. At, it maybe it's the mythical man months. Yeah. Uh, there aren't 18,000 people, people like this you can hire no matter how much money you have. Yeah. But you don't want to lose the five or ten and you've got yeah. to inspire them with the company's vision. And this or is inspire probably them with part of that. And Meta has had an issue with losing some of its brain power. I mean, yeah. a lot of good people have left for obvious reasons. Alex, you have you you have people. You know, people are still at Meta. We won't name names. Mm -hmm. Do they seem satisfied with the direction the company's taking, or are they just kind of sitting on their options and hoping to cash? Well, the out? folks that I'm the folks that I know at at Meta. Um, it seem pretty. They, they they get to work on fun things. <laughs> so yeah. they're excited. They don't really. They don't. They don't think about. I have to admit that they don't. I don't get the impression that they're thinking about the big picture of Meta or Facebook or anything else. No, they like they their job. Yeah. When they get up every morning, they get to work on something really cool, and occasionally they have to deal with the politics of a of a big company, and then they get to go back to working on something really cool where they get paid a lot of money to do something that's really fun, and that's what they care about. They don't think you about, know. And so you know, I met a guy uh, is in the release to production department. And he just loves it. He doesn't care. It's not, none of that stuff is an issue because he gets to work with new stuff and get it ready and release to production. And that's for him, right. the dream job. So he, he's not thinking, but I mean, I, I mean, if you're in the R and D in the R and D, most of the folks I know are doing R and D. R and D so is you get fun. To, you get to order, yeah. you get to order whatever you want. Yeah. You get to play, you know, do whatever. You're, you're well you're enough very, compensated that you're not, you know, tempted well, to move on. The company buys all the things that you would have bought for yourself, except they buy them so that you can keep on. Because the people who are working in that area are so passionate about what they're doing. They just love the fact that they can go out and, you know, order, oh, I'm going to order an $80,000 camera so we can see if this will work. Yeah. You know, like, like, you know, I didn't want it. Yeah. I was sitting in my apartment, you know, like, like, so I can figure out like whether this is, and, and, you know, and all of that stuff is happening right now. And, you know, and so that's a lot of really, so we, we think of it as a big number, but it's, it's a big, there are a lot of people that are really passionate about what they're doing and they're in. Yeah some really cool areas, yeah. you know, to do it. They're not doing the grind or dealing with the customers. No, or I the agree. Government. And they're not thinking about all these other issues, the Francis Hogan whistleblower and all that stuff. It's not an issue for yeah. them. Yeah. They're not, they don't, they're not thinking about it at all. It's very hard for us, uh, me, not you, because you work with these companies, but for journalists on the outside, Harry, I'm sure you kind of have this experience, to really understand how, what it's like inside a company like that. I'm sure you do a lot of interviews. You, you try to understand. I think about Microsoft, Google, Apple, Facebook, these companies we cover day in, day out. Uh, it's hard to know. We, we, I think we often anthropomorphize them and act like they're, act, like they're humans. They're not. They're, they're, they're very different from that. They're enormous. And a lot of them we just don't see. Uh, you certainly won't see them if you just go through the official channels. Right. Uh, which is why it's valuable to run into people who work at companies yeah. who are, uh, have not been um, presented to you by... The PR department of the company in question. I still want an RTP sticker. I'm, I'll put it on my laptop. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you do you have that same experience? Uh, this, this is uh, 
journalists in tech covering it from the outside, we I think sometimes we we forget what's what it's like to be on the inside. Well, and then one of the things that we haven't touched on is also the generational thing, which all of these companies are very um, attuned to as well. Where you know, it, 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 not just generational. Oh, what are what what is a nineteen year old interested in? But you know, look, all the crypto stuff and 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 things like that. Like if you're not the exciting place that people want to work at when the next big thing happens, um, that's also the thing that they're deathly afraid of and, and reputationally. And that's where the Zuck quote about like, you know, being relevant again and things like, so that if, if what Zuck wants to do is he wants to go find the hottest engineer or the hottest talent in the NFT space and be like, well, by the way, NFTs are going to be a part of the metaverse and a part of what we're right. doing in AR and VR right. too. So why don't you lead that team? He needs to, he need when he makes that offer to whoever that person is, he needs her to be like, yeah, I want to work with you. I want to, I want to build this for meta as opposed to, well, I could build it for Apple or I could start my own company. That's always what they're start your own company, concerned. right? That's if you're coming out of school, yeah. that's it's, the first thing you would think of. I would well, think. the big thing though is that it's easier to start your own company once you've worked at one of the big companies. Uh, you know, you, you come out of, you know, oh, I worked true. at Apple for two years or whatever. That's, that's right. It goes a long or way, McKinsey. you know. And I think, yeah, yeah. But and and the the interesting thing though is that you're seeing now these companies getting more aggressive. So grow with Google is is a sleeper, but it is a big deal. Yeah. Like they are saying, they're basically telling the company, they're telling universities, you are not producing enough product that we need. So we're going to go around you. You know, like we are going to educate the people in what we need because those are the what they're educating them in is the first first line of defense jobs right. that grow into all these other right. things. And so and they and they're not they don't have a lot of age requirements to do the growth. I Google. wonder how long before companies um, like Google, Apple, Microsoft, the Fangs start having high schools and middle it, schools. And, you know, it's you know, well. You don't even have to schools. own the school. It's it's interacting. I mean, the, the government's been doing this for a long long time. It's called ROTC. Yeah. You know, and so ROTC is a feeder system. Right. You know, and and our sports teams have Little League, and you know Warner. Yeah. You know, Pop yeah, Warner so what are, and, and all so these other things. So is it the first so competition? What do, what do we have? What is our Little League for Google? Um, well, and, and, it's and one Google. of the things that go they used Google. to have <laughs> to solve this problem, they don't have anymore, which is acquisitions. Right. Because you could just buy up the hottest talent to right. do the aqua hire thing. And it's so much harder for them to do that. And and for sure with Lena Khan at FTC, it's gonna get harder. Well, and, and, harder. and again, and Apple's doing the same thing with Swift Playgrounds. I mean, they are, you know, that's a smart easier and easier to, yes. It's a but that's and that's smart. getting kids in early into Swift. So more important even than getting them to you know, sometimes I think the Apple and Microsoft's you know, outreach to education is so that people get used to using Office so that when they get an Office job, they'll use Office. It isn't now, is it? It's to get them used to programming, programming. in Swift. They need coders. We need coders. They need coders. They, they're just, they're horribly short on on the supply of isn't coders. That interesting. You know, yeah. and um, and so they're, they're, they're and, and it's different, you know, uh, and they want to get them in early because the, the big thing is, is that your brain is so much so right. much more, so much, it absorbs so much more inf information when you're young. Well, and so you want coders to start when they're early. Uh, it's a little facile, but I'm also kind of a believer in Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. I really do think so, it takes I, a can while. Can I tell you something? Yeah. Can I tell you something about that quote? He stole that. Oh, so, yeah, um, of course he, he steals a lot of things, but yeah. in, in Zen, but I think Zen, Zen Buddhism, it's referred to as 10,000 mistakes. Ah. The, the, the difference between an, the, the, beginner, the beginner and the master is 10,000 10, mistakes, mistakes, not 10,000 hours. He switched it. I mean, so he stole it and then switched it. So it's his, I guess. Same but idea, though. He did enough change. But, but it's, it's 10, it, 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 you hear I this 10,000 mistakes. 10,000 mistakes. I know I've made that Way many. more. Yeah. You just want to keep on. And I'm making yeah. more than 10,000, yeah. more than one mistake an hour. So I. Exactly. <laughs> See, so you can do it so much faster <laughs> if you're reckless, you know. <laughs> so, so anyway, but, but it's, but, but that's the, um, but yeah, you want, but it's hard. Like I, I like could that. never have done. I could have never done what I did when I, and when I was 26. I was at, at Lucasfilm working on Star Wars. I, I wouldn't have done that starting at 18. Yeah. I did that when I, because I started programming when I was nine. Right. You know, and that's the, I mean, that's what you have to get kids into early. Love it. Let's take a little break. I, I love this panel. Brian McCullough's here, Tech Meme Ride home host, internet hey, historian, and Time Magazine cover collector. You, you want to know um, how to stop making mistakes, get better sleep. Oh, 
You must have Eight Sleep as a sponsor, too. (laughs) (laughs) Also, Harry McCracken, the technologizer, Alex Lindsay from officehours.global. Do you have a uh, Eight Sleep cover by any chance, Brian? I do not. Oh, um, I'm going to get you to get one. Let me tell you. Yes. Kevin Rose told me about this on a tweet some time ago. Amy Webb was on that tweet. She got one. Then she said, this is the greatest sleep. We finally got one a few months ago. I love this. Now, for a long time, we had electric blanket to keep us warm at night. And then we got electric. Instead, we got electric mattress pad. Warmth coming up. But the problem is that's a one-way trip to sweaty sleep. (laughs) The eight sleep is amazing. It not only gets warmer, it gets cooler. The eight, We have the 8 Sleep Pod Pro cover. It can go down to 55 degrees or as hot as 110 degrees. I can't wait to a hot summer night because it's going to be air conditioning in my bed. But it's amazing. And if you know, if you think a little bit, and I've read some evolutionary scientists who've said, if you think about how we sleep, they, they know that we sleep better when it's cool, not hot, when it's cool. But what you really want It's to get in bed, it's nice and toasty, and then it gets cooled off in the middle of the night. You get the deepest sleep then, and then to wake up, you warm yourself up again, and that's exactly what my 8 Sleep Pod Pro cover does. I'm going to do something a little risky here. I'm going to open up my 8 Sleep app just to see what my sleep score was. I have to say, before 8 Sleep, I'm in the 60s. I'm in the 50s. Oh, I didn't have a very good night last night. It was only 84% sleep fitness. I have to tell you, it... Normally, it's up in the 90s. Last time I showed it was 98. I think I've gotten to 100%, which I, I don't think I experienced when I was an infant. This is, the app is monitoring your sleep. It The cover actually monitors your restlessness, your heart rate, your breathing, and then adjusts the temperature according to how you're sleeping. They have something called Autopilot. Oop, I have a temperature schedule update from Autopilot. This is my temperature update. It says at bedtime, I'm going to be plus four. Then it's going to go down plus two, plus two, plus five. I have, and and, and by the way, as it gets hotter over, uh, because it also is checking the room temperature, this will modify itself automatically. It is amazing. It is absolutely transformative. And you're right, Brian, good sleep is a game changer for alertness, but not just for that, for health. Research shows good sleep can decrease the risk of heart disease. It can lower your blood pressure. Did you see my rest and heart rate? It's pretty good. Thank you, 8Sleep. More than 30% of Americans struggle with sleep. Temperature, one of the main causes of poor sleep. The solution, 8Sleep, E-I-G-H-T, sleep, and the Pod Pro cover. Now, what's nice is, of course, Lisa has different, my wife has different sleep needs. So the temperature of the cover adjusts each side of the bed. It's looking at sleep stages, biometrics, bedroom temperature, reacts intelligently. Her settings are completely different from mine. Eight sleep users fall asleep up to 32% faster, reduce sleep interruptions by 40%, and overall get a more restful sleep. And I can absolutely vouch for that. Let me just see. Last night, it was 88%. Friday night, oh, look, Thursday, I got 99%. And... I tell you, the other stats are fantastic. The time to fall asleep was one minute. That's because it was so cozy. Time to get up, six minutes. It wakes me up by heating up, and I jump out of bed. It's fantastic. You can see your sleep stages, your tosses and turns, your sleeping heart rate, which for me got down to 62. This is, I I love you, eight sleep. I just want to say this. I love you deeply. With 30% more deep sleep, I feel like my mind and body are moving through The restorative sleep stages, vital for physical recovery, hormone regulation, mental clarity. When I work out and I know, you know, my resting heart rate is down low, my heart rate variability is high, I just feel better. Powered by 8 Sleep, I can show up as the best partner, parent, and podcaster. (laughs) So that's why, Brian McCullough, you have to get 8 Sleep. 8sleep.com slash twit. We're going to save you $150 at checkout on the Pod Pro cover. They also have a mattress. 8 Sleep currently ships within the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. $150 off when you go to 8 Sleep, E-I-G-H-T, sleep.com slash twit. All right, I'm going to... 
stop raving about this, but I have to say it's the best night's sleep I've ever had. And Lisa and I are both saying, this is going to be great on those hot summer nights when it's you're sweaty, you're hot, you can't cool off. You got the We get the fan on and it's like, oh, you're dying. I don't have to worry about it. It's just going to cool. It's going to be so nice. I can't wait. It's so great. Eight sleep. And it's been great during the cold winter nights too. Eightsleep.com slash twit. Talking about VR, Harry McCracken. I've heard of him. Fast company. Uh, earlier this month, wrote an article, what the 1994 Bill Gates keynote tells us about the metaverse. Did, did Bill know about the metaverse in 1994? He didn't, but he spent a lot of time talking about what the next 10 years of technology would be like at that point, which were about the information superhighway. And, so let uh, me think. This was Windows 311. Right, this right, was DOS 6. windows 95. Yeah, um, yeah. And um, he, at the time, he did these keynotes at Comdex, which was the big I, it was a big deal. show. Yeah, this was the big keynote. You'd get up early at 8 a.m. Yeah. to see the keynote the day before the show began. Dvorak once edited all of Bill Gates' keynotes into um, gulps and just had a long, like a half an hour of him going. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny, but, but he actually took out all the meat. So. What was the meat in this one? Well, he did this, uh, in 1994, he did this particularly elaborate one, which involved him on stage, but also this pretty lavish movie that um, Microsoft had made set in 2005, which... Oh, again, I remember that. At the point, at this point, this, that was a decade in the future. Isn't that funny? And it showed all the technology we'd be using then. Uh, we'd all be using wallet PCs, yeah. which, which were not smartphones, but they were rather smartphone-like. Um, and along with giving you access to data wherever you were, um, people would use them like to control larger screens. So you'd be sitting in front of your TV and you'd use your wallet PC as kind of a remote control. Um, this was the information right. at your fingertips. Uh, yeah, he, he, uh, he showed that we'd all be getting video on demand and we'd be able to binge. Look at that. looks just like my Tesla. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, wow. Essentially, he got a lot of the broad brushstrokes pretty well. Pretty, he got pretty close on the broad brush strokes. And now, almost all this of the, was before the famous internet memo, right? Or was it right around? This was, the, I think, at roughly the same time. Okay, because um, for a long time, he did oh, not think the internet was going to well, be. Well, the, the internet and uh, the web only come up a little bit in this discussion. Um, it, he doesn't completely ignore them, but it, it, at this point, What's, it wasn't clear whether it would be the, the internet that would give us the information superhighway, or it might be cable TV. Let's go into the uh, the home of... 2005, which again then was 10 years in the future. It's a nice looking house. There's Mom. Uh, oh, I remember yeah. this. The well, movie is about this kid who gets. Um, uh, wait a minute, I have to. Uh, I, oh no, I thought that was that was the they was watching the uh, the uh, TV. I didn't realize. I thought that was a background noise. He's watching the news on his iPad. Aren't you supposed to be working on your report for world cultures? I am. Mm -hmm. This is not it. Yeah. Turn it off. At this point, even flat screens were kind of futuristic. Really? Generally speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember they were so big, those times. Not have them in 1994. The CRTs. Don't even start. I have a video conference later today. They can Look, she just this. picked up her Alexa. Good morning, Mom. Oh, oh, there's her Ecobee uh, smart thermostat. She's setting the... She's about to watch some TV. <laughs> Uh, now, this she was wrong on this. Interactive TV never did take off. Have did a great it? evening. Thanks for watching. Good night, everybody. She's watching last night's. Now, this was a big deal in 95. Last night's Letterman. This is pre TiVo. Yeah. And there's uh, all her shows. Oprah. Yeah. I guess this isn't actually far off from streaming. No, I mean, we, we, we do this we today, do this now. although not in exactly the way that. Um, the interface show, and it, it took yeah. a little bit longer for it to become. And Oprah's no longer on, so that's another. Confidant in person today. Partners in cyberspace meet face to face. And we don't call it cyberspace time. anymore. Will thank God. Survive? Um, all right, let me skip ahead a little bit. What else? Uh, what else are we going to look for in our? Uh, if they in show, our if you can find the wallet PCs, that was a big part of this movie. Yeah, let me jump ahead. Um, the kid this also is, does this amazing multimedia presentation at school, which today would not be particularly exciting. This is when uh, Microsoft spent millions with pro actors and all sorts of stuff on these videos. I kind of miss these keynotes, Comdex keynotes. Oh, I mean, they, people still still spend millions on their Do keynotes. they? Oh, here's the wallet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here's the wallet PC. The kids got it. 
All right, let's go back here. For the very first time. She's still watching. Will Mom's still watching Oprah, as Mom does. We'll talk about it on today's Oprah. It's a little sexist. Next. Mom is not a CEO at a major Fortune 500 company, apparently. She's got lots she of time have a Zoom to watch TV. The beginning. Yeah. <laughs> She watches a lot of TV. 2004. All right. Welcome back to CBS right. this morning. I'm Harry Smith. Good morning. Okay, okay. I'm Let's skip on. ahead. This Where's morning, the, the wallet? This morning, the on the transition at the White House. We're going to be taking a close look at the president-elect's plans for the nation. Oh, who's the president in 2005? She says it is she? Oh, it's a woman. Uh, yeah, no, sorry. All right, here's the... Here, wait a minute. The, this is a cop show now. There, there's a murder mystery that's part of this. Oh, uh, Lord. <laughs> There's, a plot. In the There's a plot. There's a plot to this. In the Do you remember Harry sitting in the audience well, and actually, seeing this? No, I, I made a point of not going to Bill Gates. You know, <laughs> at that, at that point. Although now, I, of course, I wish that I wish had. Wish you had. Yeah. The only reason to go at the time really was yeah. these movies. But I discovered this once it came up on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, well, 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 tell me about the wallet PC. Is it like a smartphone? So no. It's, it's a small screen you put in your pocket. I mean, this is Microsoft talking, so they think of it as being a PC. Right. But apparently you do not make phone calls on it. Um, uh, touch screens are not part of this vision at all, I, I, if I remember correctly. Is there any AR, VR at all? No, I don't think so. Either. So his idea of the metaverse is still at arms, kind of arm's length. Yeah, and, um, and to be fair, they're trying to do stuff that's, out there, but not incredibly out there. They, um, I, th I think he was trying to kind of pretty much figure out what the, the next things would be. And um, I thought of this, again, coming back to Mark Zuckerberg. Um, he's somebody who now is making these pretty elaborate videos showing life in the metaverse. That's right. Um, which are really, in a lot of ways, reminiscent to this. And I think the lesson is, um, A, uh, if you're really smart, you might get some of the, of the broad picture right. Um, but that doesn't mean you can predict the little details. And B, when when the stuff did come along, um, again, kind of a little bit more like 2007, 2008, moving forward rather than 2005, um, the fact that Bill Gates was pretty good at anticipating what would happen did not mean that Microsoft dominated all the stuff that came. Um, Very good point. Instead, Microsoft released a lot of things that weren't terribly successful. They did, they did not dominate smartphones. Um, they had a Holy crap. Um, video on demand Holy crap. platform. What? what? H Harry, I just did the math. When this video happened, Gates was 39. Today, Mark Zuckerberg is 38. Uh-huh. That probably makes sense. That's when you kind of are at your peak mastery right. of the universe. And right? probably when you start to worry about the future, the future. maybe may yeah. running away from you and somebody else yeah. determining that. So, um, so the fact that Microsoft, even though it, it was quite good, at predicting the future was not e really able to leverage that, partially because it had this big business in Windows, which defined how it how it saw the world. I think has some lessons for us when we we look at. What well, Meta's I, I, as today. I said, I think Mark has learned that innovator's dilemma yeah. m m m message, and is willing yeah. to. That's why I think he's willing to to risk yeah. Meta in order to achieve this vision. But you make an excellent point. And Just because you can see this, we can see it. Doesn't mean we're going to be a, instrumental. <laughs> in the next 10, 20 years. And Microsoft never bet everything on something else. Instead, it, it saw everything right. as being an extension of Windows, which in, mo in most cases did not really work out that way. I think that that's one thing you could say. Mark is not saying this, oh, the metaverse was Facebook extended. I mean, he does certainly have a social aspect. That's part it, of it. I mean, yeah. I think the idea is you will still want to hang out with your friends yeah, in right. the metaverse. Yeah, the graph that Facebook has of people and they're connected, how they're connected to other people is very advantageous for a virtual world. And again, I think that that's an interesting puzzle where you see Apple not going down that path. They're not trying to build that out. They're trying to augment what you already have. They're you know, not so worried about that, social at all. Not yet. Not yet. Apple's I mean, I, only I assays into social were historic flops, right? Yeah, because they don't think that way. They think so much about privacy and about the individual that I think they have a hard time getting, even, even when you look at pages and numbers, which I love, by the way, um, but the interaction between other people, like sharing your pages or Keynote is a great way to just not have it work anymore. So it's, you know, <laughs> like it doesn't work at all. Apple in my did, uh, they did Ping, they did ping which with did iTunes, which was yeah, a that didn't. flop. Then remember, they were early on in uh, dial-up uh, networking. They, they had a little e town. E-World. Oh, e e E-World. Uh, and you'd wander through this town. And, yeah. and I, I think, think that the Apple's message was... 
interoperable with uh, AIM back in the day too, right? Like that was a yeah. big seller for. So yeah. they learned a couple of things. One, never be, never interoperate. I think lately, lately they've done a better job. I mean, both FaceTime and iMessage are looking like social platforms and have a ton of people using them. Here was uh, here was the e eWorld uh, interface. Which and it was a, it was like AOL. It was a social network, so you would go in and get your email. Uh, that kind of looks like a metaverse, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> if you could only put on a headset and be there. What that, year was that again? That was I'm not sure if that I feel was, like that was roughly the same time as that Bill Gates keynote. Um, uh, 1996. It was closed yeah. in 1996. So um, um, I'm not sure if that was Scully or Spindler or, it wasn't or, or Emilio, Steve. but yeah, uh, yeah. But it was not Steve. No. Yeah, maybe Apple learned learned a lesson and said, nah, social's not it. But And honestly, I think Apple wouldn't care if you used whatever hardware they made in the meta metaverse. That's that's not their business. They Go ahead and use it with Facebook's Yeah, they metaverse. might be fine with you using somebody else's metaverse right. platform and <laughs> Apple hardware. But the, what? But they, of course, what they, Facebook wants to avoid is the thirty percent surcharge. <laughs> Apple's like, sure, you can use our hardware; it's still going to be. 30%. Apple's actually yeah. getting a little uh, a little fun out of Facebook's announcement that they're going to charge forty seven point five percent on Metaverse items. Apple says this shows Facebook's hypocrisy because, uh, uh, of course, Facebook's been complaining about uh, Apple's thirty percent vig. Forty-seven point five percent. Well, because because isn't it something like I know I did the story, but I don't remember. Um, a certain percentage goes to the Oculus platform, right? And then a certain percentage. Where does the other one go? So I for every so for every item sold in Horizon Worlds, which is Facebook's social VR platform, a thirty percent goes to Meta via the Oculus platform. Twenty-five percent goes to the Meta App Store. Oh, twenty five percent of the seventy percent goes to the Meta App but, but Store. They can say, "Look, our our App Store only takes twenty five percent." I imagine it all ends up not, in the not, same not to place. mention that for ninety eight percent of the developers, Apple takes fifteen. <laughs> so, so it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, somebody tweets: "The future of work is giving Meta forty seven point five percent of your salary." Apparently. <laughs> And no one has legs. <laughs> I think with, no I think with all legs. these, I think with all these percentages, though, people are are forgetting that you know the Gap is buying shirts for four dollars and selling them to us for forty. Right. I mean, like, markup like, is you know, a, yeah. Like, yeah. Markup is a, a great American a lot tradition. Of, a lot of margin in in a lot of things, and so we have this thing like we know that 047 is really high. Well, do we? I mean, yeah. you know, like the yeah. it's it, there's a lot of when they cut when they cut it off at a at a, at a, at a garment store for half off, they're still making margin. Yeah, they're but just is not making as much as they were before. Is that true in a platform economy where I have to make my margins on top of your margins on top of someone else's margins? Do you know what I mean? Like, it is. I, I get what you're saying. It is rent yeah, seeking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's complicated. Saying, we just don't, it's complicated because it, it sometimes it's worth it and sometimes it's not. Right. I don't right. think Netflix should have to pay Apple thirty percent, but if you've developed a game like Fortnite, I think that's appropriate. So. I don't know, and you know, it requires Apple's platforms. I don't. Th I don't know. We have these conversations on uh, Mac Break Weekly, yeah. uh, weekly as a matter of, as a matter of <laughs> yeah, fact. just about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, big tech is pouring money into something that doesn't exist yet. This article from the Atlantic uh, about carbon removal. Google and Facebook, nearly a billion dollars into a technology to zero out emissions, but. There is no technology yet. The theory is if we pour money into it, maybe that technology will be invented. And there is a history that might confirm that. In 2010, a set of donors committed $1.5 billion to buy a vaccine for streptococcus pneumonia before it had been invented. But that advanced market commitment spurred the rapid innovation well, and deployment of a pneumococcal vaccine, which has saved You can say that about COVID as well. Lives. Yeah, I mean, you know, we 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 figured out how to make a vaccine really fast with a lot, an enormous amount of money that no one wants to talk about. <laughs> right, like, like how much money they spent. Well, but we'd been working on mRNA vaccines for a decade, trying yeah. to get them yeah. to work, right? And then the time but, came, and we and we needed them, and they did right. work. Uh, I think that's a worthwhile expenditure. Are you saying it was too much money, Alex? 
No, not at all. Okay. No, good. I'm saying I'm saying that we, we were able to make it work. <laughs> yeah. You know, like we were we were making we were able to make it work by pre investing, uh, but by yes. by putting in pre investing yeah. and then putting an enormous amount of money in when it was needed. Yeah. And we may have to do that with carbon, you know, sequester. Sequester. there's a lot of easier ways to do it. In a lot of there's things those trees and mangroves, <laughs> all kinds of stuff that if we planted more of would probably that works now. It works today. Yeah. For success. So, <laughs> so it's, 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 they're putting money, $925 million, uh, into a new company owned by Stripe called Frontier. Hmm. Uh, Frontier has investments in 17 different, uh, or I'm sorry, 14 different carbon uh, removal startups. Uh, one called Carbon Built is trying to sequester carbon, trying is the operative word so far, to sequester carbon by capturing it in concrete. The Future Forest Company wants to accelerate the natural process of rock weathering. I, somehow that helps. Uh, uh, Project Vesta wants to line beaches with a carbon capturing mineral, mineral called olivine. Rock weathering, by the way, is the natural. That's how the globe. When 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 t plate tectonics goes under, like that's how most of the carbon. Oh, it gets sequestered. Gets yeah. By just getting yeah. sucked under the crust. Um, that's the natural process of removing carbon. From yeah. I like their uh, motto, "Uneffing the future. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, you know what? I, I'm not going to, in fact, <clears throat> is that all? 925 million? Could we put a little more in, please? Yeah, well, I mean, notice, that's, like, again, that's like, the, that's the, like the, flicking the, a the, bill off the outside yeah, of your, yeah, your role. Yeah. I'm just saying here. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're saying it's still a thousand times shorter the market we need by 2050. But also, the market here is there, it's similar to the mRNA stuff, which is they're assuming the governments of the world are going to pay for this. Right. Because if who's who, who would be motivated to get the, um, the who, who could pay for getting the carbon out of the atmosphere? So they're assuming, I'm looking right here, the carbon removal market will probably need to reach $1 trillion a year for it to work out. But who would pay for that would be um, the world's uh They're just moving country. the technology forward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Intel says they're going to have a net zero carbon emission. Their goal, though, not till 2040. And they've only really got uh, ideas for, the f for two of the three scopes that are commonly causing uh, carbon emissions. Scope one is raw material. Scope two is manufacturing. But, of course, creating microprocessors uses a lot of nasty chemicals. And uh, they're only going to rely on offsets for the hardest to reduce emissions, the ones involved in making things like perfluorocarbons, which uh, warm the planet a thousand times more than carbon dioxide. So chip making is a nasty, nasty process. And Intel says, well, by 2040, it's going to be less nasty, I guess would be the, the phrase. Not so nasty. Houston Astros Stadium using Amazon's walkout technology, the first Major League Baseball stadium. That should go well. I want to just take a hot dog and go out and watch the ball game. Um, Astros have teamed up with Amazon to install just walkout systems in two concession stores in Minute Maid Park, the 19th hole or market. So if you're in, a, in the Houston area, get your snacks and souvenirs. You insert your credit card at the entry gate. You grab things off the shelf, and you leave when you're done. Don't, don't you always feel like I buy a lot of stuff at the app? When, when I buy stuff at the Apple store, I don't buy a lot of stuff. I don't get there very often. But I, when I go there, I buy it usually with my phone. I just open up yeah. the app store. An Apple store, and I just take a picture of it, and and then it charges me, and then I walk out, and I, I always feel like I'm stealing. Like I, I always feel waiting. like someone's going to stop me. Yeah. Like, no, 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 I paid for this. <laughs> oh. yeah. uh, Amazon is um, working also with Starbucks on um, this um, automated checkout, and there's a uh, Amazon Go store I go to a lot in San Francisco. Do you use it? Yeah, I do. But I'm, does it make you nervous? I'm usually it, not not anymore, but. I am interested in the fact that I, I'm usually the only person there, and I kind of wonder whether maybe the future of this technology is is not Amazon opening up lots of stores that offer it so much as these partnerships. Yeah, yeah, Harry, haven't haven't you heard that they're sort of pulling back a bit, like they're taking their foot off the pedal a little bit on on this sort of stuff? Maybe retail, generally, their yeah, retail. Yeah, I mean, um, they've shut yeah. down a lot of their retail. They, the, they shut the down their bookstores. Yeah. 
Um, the, um, the Amazon Go stores, at least the ones I go to, cut way back on the number of products they sell. I mean, I think they were unfortunate enough to be trying to ramp them up right before the pandemic started, and there's just less need for convenience stores, at least in San Francisco, than there once was. Um, well, I think especially in San Francisco, just walk out is a, is a recipe for trouble. I think people have already started that in well, many stores in San Francisco. Yeah, well, um, at the Amazon Go store, it's, it, uh, you can just walk out, but just walking in is a bit of a challenge. Because right. You need to, you have get, to have your get your phone. Amazon app, yeah. app up. Yeah. It used to be that there was an Amazon Go app that was pretty convenient, but now they make you use the Amazon app, and you have to scroll through to find this barcode, which it generates on the fly. Every and time I'm in Whole Foods. It, sometimes it doesn't work very well. They so. want me to scan my phone, and I start playing with it. I go, oh, forget it. I'll just pay. You know, <laughs> I don't want, I don't the, want. Funny thing, the funny thing is the, 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 the Whole Foods app, it has a problem where the QR code doesn't come up yeah. very fast. It takes a long time, yeah. but the Amazon one goes really fast. So it just pops right up. Like if you, it, you, you get used to it after. Should a I use while. the Amazon app instead of the Whole Foods app? Well, what's nice about it is if I ever can't remember what I bought that I liked. Oh, then you know. They know, they know they what know. it is. And, and so everything. the hard part for me is that I would, I actually like um, check, you know, checking out without talking to anybody. But the problem is, is that in Whole Foods, I only, I really only shop the edges. Like I don't really buy products in boxes. And so, right. so the problem is, is that that becomes really difficult. Like if you've got, I, you know, I, I always said I was never going to be that person that just has a pile of raw materials. It takes forever to get through the, I never, I was always but behind you people. are like, now. Oh my God. Now I am. That's I know. All I and so, it's a way to shop. so the problem is you can't, you can't go through the, trying to go through the automated thing with like lettuce and asparagus and stuff like that is not trivial. <laughs> like it, it takes a long time. I'd rather just have somebody scan it. You bought so that's a, asparagus. You yeah. bought rutabaga. Weigh it. You, you can't. You can't run, roll over it. You have to weigh it. And yeah. so you have to sit there, you set it down, and I'm just like, oh, yeah. I can't. I can't. I think we're all going to be you know, begging so. for the return of cashiers any minute now. Yeah. Hey, I want to take a little break before we wrap things up. We're getting towards the end of the show, but I do want to show you this. This is Blue Land. We were talking about. Uh, being environmentally conscious, the number one thing we're trying to do at home is eliminate single-use plastics, plastic bags, plastic bottles. It's a huge problem. Every year, five billion, five billion with a B, plastic hand soap and cleaning bottles are thrown away. And when you buy those bottles, they're mostly water. You're you're paying, and tr trucks to ship water, ninety percent water around the country. It's bad for the planet, bad for your wallet. I've got a better way. It's Blue Land, and I am a huge fan. I wanted to do a little science experiment because I've talked about Blue Land a lot. This is the Blue Land foaming hand soap. So this is designed never to be thrown out. It's a beautiful, heavy glass container. I filled it with water, so that didn't have to be shipped anywhere, up to the fill line. And then I'm going to add the, let's see, what flavor is this? Iris Agave, the foaming hand soap. Little, this is the little tablet. And you subscribe and they send you the tablet in the mail so you never run out. It makes the best hand soap ever. And I don't throw away plastics, but it's not just hand soap. Get in there. There we go. We're going to make some hand soap. By the time the commercial is done, we will have some fun. Harry, you can wash your hands with my F Iris Agave foaming hand soap. Actually, they have lots of flavors Sometimes special flavors for Christmas. I got gingerbread, so I smell like gingerbread whenever I wash my hands. Here's the, here's the, uh, the kinds of bottles. This is the, um, let's see, it says multi-surface cleaner. Same thing. Fill it with water. You get the tablet. We use their powder for our wa dishwasher, uh, which works every bit as well, if not better, than the plastic pods we used to use. Same thing for our washing machine. They've got cleaners. The toilet tablets are fantastic. And by the way... These sell out every time they've got them. They've got some more in stock. The Blue Land Toilet Tablet Cleaner. You just pop it in the toilet, walk away, finish your house cleaning, scrub the toilet with a little brush. You're done. It's going to sell out again, I know. From the best-selling Clean Essentials Kit to their Hand Soap Duo to their plastic-free laundry and dishwasher tablets, I'm just a huge fan. Blue Land has something for every inch of your home. I love Blue Land. Their high-quality forever bottles start at just $10 when you buy a kit. They're meant to be reused forever. No more plastics in the landfill. And the money-saving refill tablets, it's just two bucks. So you just pop those in, and uh, you never run out of hand soap or cleaning solutions or laundry detergent. I think it's a great way to eliminate waste. Pa and these are not, you're not sacrificing anything. These are great cleaners. They really work. At least I actually did an experiment with our dishwashing soap and our uh, laundry detergent. We replaced them with Blue Land. 
And she said, can you tell the difference? I said, no. It is great. Love Blue Land. Beautiful bottles. Beautiful solutions. Oh, that smell. That smells so good. Iris agave, perine lemon, lavender, eucalyptus. Right now, 20% off your first order. Go to blueland.com slash twit. Blueland.com slash twit. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order. Get your Blue Land products, blueland.com slash twit. I won't make you wash your hands, Harry. But this, I have to tell you, it's the best. I have every bathroom in our house has Blue Land foaming hand soap. It's still dissolving. When it's done, we can all wash our hands of, of this show. Thank you. Blue Land. We love you. Blueland.com slash twit. Thank you for your support of uh, This Week in Tech. Our first science project <laughs> on the show, John. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we had a great week this week at Twit, and we have a wonderful little mini movie. Our talented staff, I think Victor made this just for your delectation. Enjoy. Today, we're going to do a fireside chat with the man that most of you all know as the angry one on this hey. week in Google. Hey, <laughs> hey, who's angry here? Previously on Twit, hands on photography. I challenged you. You stepped up for the challenge. Yep, we're talking about the moon photography challenge. You guys sent in a bunch of different images. I'm only going to show you a handful of them. Tech News Weekly. So what does an NFT of a tweet mean? I don't know, but Astavi paid $2.9 million for it. Whoa. Uh, the, you know, the punchline is that he is now trying to sell it, and <laughs> the best offer he got was actually $10,000. For $10,000, do you find value in Dorsey's original uh, tweet? I think I would pay $2.80. Okay. <laughs> nice, nice. It <laughs> started there. <laughs> yeah. This Week in Google. Gilbert Gottfried uh, passed away uh, at the young age of 67. Way too young. Yeah, very disturbing. Here, here's the real Gilbert Gottfried playing Microsoft's favorite mascot. Office XP, eh? Well, we'll just see about this. Hey, you! It looks like you're writing a letter. Would you like... Beat it. Twit. Hey, you! <laughs> <laughs> they stopped right there. I, they didn't want my full Gilbert Gottfried impression. Okay, I understand that. By the way, Owen Thomas, who is on Tech News Weekly there, will be joining us next week, I think, on uh, Twit. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. That interview with Jeff Jarvis, I don't want to disappoint you, but that's for Club Twit members. It appears on the Twit Plus feed. A little plug for Club Twit, ad-free versions of all the shows. You don't get the science experiments. You, you just get the content. Uh, plus, you get access to the Discord, which is so much fun. We love our Club Twit Discord. It's my personal favorite social network of all time. And the Twit Plus feed. We have so many shows that are only in Club Twit now. Uh, Stacy's Book Club, that's part of the Twit Plus feed. The Untitled Linux Show, the Giz Fizz with Dick D. Bartolo, and we are launching more shows. Some of those shows, thanks to members, uh, are we are able to then put into the regular feed, like This Week in Space with Rod Pyle and Tarek Malik, which we just launched in our regular feeds, our newest show on the Twit Network, thanks to the support of our Club Twit members. I think it's a pretty good deal for seven bucks a month. Twit.tv slash Club Twit. Thank you very much. We're talking about Mark Zuckerberg. He has very good security. He has the most expensive security in Silicon Valley, $25.2 million a year to protect Zuck. Sheryl Sandberg, $9 million. Sundar Pichai, only four point three. million. For some reason, Evan Spiegel of chat really thinks he's at risk. He's got $2.3 million. More than Larry Ellison, two point two. million. Jeff Bezos, a mere $1.6 million to protect Jeff. But that's because he's so buff he can protect himself. Warren Buffett, just $273,000. And uh, the CEO, the new CEO of Twitter, Parag Agrawal, uh, $63.8 thousand dollars. But no number on Elon Musk. I wonder how much he doesn't want to talk about it. I wonder what's, how much. What's the number on you, Leo? My security? I, uh, <laughs> I don't know. We should have some. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Right. Well, no, we laid them no off. That's should. right. No, no one really, no one really knows what Burke's background is. You know, Leo <laughs> keeps that secret. top secret. That's they the just secret. think he's the cook, but he's, he's not. A, he's, he's, he's a king of kickboxing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, we actually had a we had a guard at the front desk. Uh, the great mm -hmm. Mo loved him. Ex Marine carried. A, he was licensed to carry uh, and uh, had a you know was 
greeted everyone coming in the door with a stern expression. But uh, when COVID hit, nobody came to the door anymore. So we had right. to lay him off. But Mo's a great guy. He got a he got another job, I'm glad to say. And I guess maybe someday we'll we'll bring him back. I don't, I'm still nervous about having people in studio. I don't know. You're okay, Harry. I checked you out. Yeah, but I'm the only person here. Yeah. Other than yeah. the gang. Yeah. He said that and looked right at Harry with a million stare. <laughs> when was the last time you had an actual audience in here? Uh, I think it would probably be February 2020. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Nobody's come in since. We closed the studio a little bit before the state of California shut down on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. But we decided to uh, mostly to protect. I asked the employees, I said, how do you feel about letting people come in? And the, a number of them said, you know, we don't feel safe with that. So we we shut it down earlier. I, I don't remember the date. Do you remember, John? No, I think it was early March. Maybe for your 18th anniversary, you can bring them back. I'm thinking 20th. I don't know. Sometime, someday. Uh, we'd have to bring Mo back, too, because I, I've got to have security. I do. What do you think they get for 20? You would know this. Alex, you seem like a a guy who would know what you get for $25 million in security. You know, a lot of it has to do with a function a function of how much uh, uh, how much you travel. You know, so a lot of that expense, and then how also how it's just budgeted by the by the company because the private jet's have, expensive, right? I mean, that's well, well, but that doesn't count. Is that I mean, that they're, that's the, the the executive has that, and so it doesn't right. cost more to put someone in. I mean, all, the only difference is the little sandwiches, you know. So the so the um, <laughs> you gotta have a taste. They're, they're expensive. The they're expensive. Yeah, we'll yeah. say the sandwiches are really good. Anyway, so <laughs> the um, <laughs> it's remarkably good. Like you're like, how did they get the really? Thing? Anyway, really? So, See, I've really never really been really in a, a private uh, jet. So yeah, I, I had to do a bunch of tests in a G4, and so I, it was it was fun because I just had to do. Just got to fly around trying to stream out of a G4, which doesn't work. In case you're wondering. Oh, really? Anyway, anyway, so yeah. like somebody <laughs> was saying, our executive wants to do a show. No, out it was of an, event. G4. an event. It was an event from a G4. They wanted to shoot the eclipse from a G4. Um, oh, well, that's cool. And so they wanted to stream 160 miles off the coast of of of, of uh, Oregon. Which means you can't shoot down because you can't, you know, so that's how, you know, and you can't, and then it didn't have an up uh, pointed satellite dish. And so you couldn't, we, so we were, we told them this isn't going to work. I'm not going to say who it was. We told them it wasn't going to work, but they still wanted, they were committed to doing it. And I was like, well, if you want me to go up and test it, I will I'm test it for you. I'm going to need sandwiches and, is what you uh, said. Yeah, but, but, well, they just, they just, just, they just rented a G4 and it comes with the sandwiches and, a, and someone who serves them. It you know? comes so, with anyway, sandwiches. So, so and they're really nice they're really good sandwiches anyway so the um but the air the, force uh, one however can stream i should say yeah yeah right? exactly so yes. so you know the, with security though i mean uh, so a lot of some someone at that level is is typically pulling people out of soft you know special operations and as well as sas i mean those are the two and the problem is is that the issue that you have with it is that they have to be good at what they do. And these are usually people who are really good at what they do. Um, and they also have to be uh, public facing. So there's a lot of people who are really good, good at looking. In, well, they can't have face and, 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 tats. And not gruff. And not, not gruff. you know, like, yes, this way, like not Mo. like yeah. respond, you know, Mo respond badly. Sweetheart. Yeah. So, so the thing is, is that there's, there, you know, so there's a big percentage of the people who aren't publicly facing end up at Blackwater and the people who are publicly uh, facing end up in security <laughs> and but you are competing with Blackwater salaries which are like 300,000 a year so so you you know you get a group of people that that have to take care of someone then you end up with you know six to eight of folks there that's your base then you have to travel them around then you have to you know then you have you know all their hotels and anytime you go anywhere there's a group of these people that are that are wandering around and making sure everything's working so you have you know it, it if, if the person travels a lot so you know my guess is it's it's heavily related to how much an executive travels is how much and mark you know we we would assume gets around and uh and so the other thing is you'd have so to pay a, me a lot of money to be willing to take a bullet for mark you know what i'm saying oh he's people, he's people who live near he's not he's a good uh, guy <laughs> they, they certainly really talk is. about the experience of encountering his security uh oh really yes well didn't he buy all the houses around his house I believe so. Yeah. And in Hawaii, yeah. I'm going to move the microphone closer to you because uh, it's monitoring you. Uh, <laughs> and in Hawaii, he bought all the land around. In fact, that's a big controversy because he, he bought lots of land. He, and he tried to keep people off the beaches where they Well, and them. is that, is, is he traveling? Back? I've, I've, I did a story on that. Like he's been going back and forth to, I think, Hawaii and LA a lot. Like maybe is, it, it is the travel just back and forth between his like remote work stuff. He, and, and this is the other thing. He only gets a, a dollar a year. 
compensation. He's doing okay. I'm sure he's not. <laughs> You just, but what does he have to sell stock a little bit at a time just to pay for the a lot of so a lot like, of executives like have a walker? schedule. How do you pay for the dog walker? So right? a, a lot of a lot of executives have a set schedule to sell their stock. Right. So to, you know they that, have you to, don't want right? to have any surges because if, if you start selling a lot of it all at one right. time, someone some, thinks something happened, yeah. and so you set up a schedule, and so it's just right. turning that turning that over, and you're okay. generating revenue from but it. But then, all if the you time. decide you want to buy Twitter, <laughs> then that's <screws laughs> everything. You need to. That's a lot. All of, up. Well, the other thing they do is they borrow against their, they borrow against right. their stock, right. and then they and then that that's tax free, you know. So making a dollar just means you're not paying. You tax probably doing a lot of stories, I'm sure, Brian, on NFTs, cryptocurrency. Yes. There've been a lot of uh, ripoffs and scams lately. Yes. I thought I'd do a positive story about crypto. The bored apes are getting a movie trilogy. <laughs> I did this one too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Coinbase is producing a, a trio of films. But wait, stop, Leo. Coinbase is producing, not Paramount. Pictures. Not Hollywood. Coinbase. I'm sure that'll turn out great. Um, the hard part, the hard part there is, is again talent. Like the streaming companies have taken up, like everybody's busy, you know. So if, if you're not doing it with a big studio, you're gonna it's wait, wait, Leo. Set talent. the table, and then there's. The, I, I want to tell you the most interesting thing about this. Okay, the uh, the um, th first of three installments for the series of animated shorts called the Deegan trilogy. I'm sure there's a meaning to that. Will premiere no Degen like oh Degen like yes, oh yes, yes. degenerative because they're bored apes, so they're degenerative. We'll premiere at NFT NYC in June with the NFT community of apes and non-apes alike having a say in the film's plot. Oh, it goes downhill. Oh. It goes downhill. So what's the what's the what's the story? Well, so not only is it plot by committee, but also um, one of the interesting things, at least I've been told, but we'll see how this actually plays out. But it, it, you own the IP of the ape that you own. That's like part right. of what they put into the DAO. Right. So you're <laughs> the most interesting thing to me was everyone is allowed to um, audition their ape to be in the show. Or in the how movie. do you audition an NFT? Well, but that's, I, I mean, this is what's interesting. <laughs> you have to apply and be like, look, my ape is the coolest. He's got a sort of, remember Leonardo from the Teenage Mutant Ninja yeah, Turtles? Yeah. He's got like that sort of, uh, yeah. you know, he's a rebel, but he's cool, you yeah. know, like vibe. I don't know. You will not be able to see the videos unless you have a Coinbase wallet. Um, okay. I think they're, I think to be fair, I think they're going to debut it. And God, listen, God knows if it was popular, you'll see it in a multiplex. That's right. But then eventually <laughs> sort of like Disney used to do with, you know, <laughs> Snow White, they'll put it in a vault and only certain people can see it. Did you ever go to the Bored Ape Yacht Club themed Papa Burger restaurant in Long Beach? Oh, my <laughs> God. What I mean, we think of all these, we think of all these things as crazy, but the reality is the art world has been crazy for a long time. You know, like it's it's not. There's nothing like someone sold a banana sure. for 185 thousand sure, dollars, right. and so sure. So it's you know it's not any like NFTs. It's like just, Artwork Basel, Art World Basel, or something like that, right? You know, I, 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 one of the greatest pieces of art of all time is Duchamp's urinal, right? Which he called fountain, which was a urinal, right? But he called it a fountain on a wall. And he put it on the wall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Isn't that funny? Ha ha. No, you're right. Or the banana, which apparently... Oh, but, but you, know. I, I, you know, I was talking to someone about NFTs, and the best thing that ever someone ever said when it clicked for me about NFTs was was when he said when, when he said it was basically Babe Ruth's you know 1927 card. The paper is worth nothing. Like the paper, the True. paper of the mm -hmm. card is worth nothing. True. It's because we have provenance and we say it's valuable. Like right. that is it. Like right. you know, and and the blockchain gives it provenance, and then we just start saying it's valuable. So what went wrong? <laughs> so, with Jack Dorsey's first tweet, it was absurd. It was an absurd idea. <laughs> like, okay, it's a lot of. There's a lot of art that gets bought and then it's not worth anything. Yeah. Later. Leo, I mean, it's like, yeah. are you aware? Are you aware of the fact that I'm pretty sure no one has been able to disprove this? I I made an NFT of um, a podcast episode. I think it was January of last year. It's uh, see if you can find it. It's on Rarible. Look for Tech Meme Ride Home on Rarible. But. Um, <laughs> I I might I've only sold eight of the ten, 
but I'm pretty sure it's the first NFT of a, of a podcast episode. So, so you, you get a uh, pride of pride of place in that respect. That's what I'm trying to say. Here it is. I, and I, this was the this interview up, with Gary Tan from February 6th of last year. Yeah. Titled bonus office hours with, did you, was there some reason Gary Tan? Um, no, I just, we were talking about NFTs. At could the have time been me. I, I agree. Yeah, I, I missed I the opportunity to be a pioneer yeah. in this space. The, the point current, we're trying to make is there's two left and it's the first one. That's the point we're trying to make. The current highest bid. No, there's eight left. There's eight oh, there's left. There's eight left. I, I meant it's the ten. One. The, it's the you made it ten, so two are gone. The most important thing is Christmas, I sold two. Yeah. I sold two. Christmas Eve I bought one, which is nice. I, I sold two and I lost money because the gas fees, gas fees. to actually <laughs> so make the sale happen cost more than I yeah. got in the year. So you're saying you, you sold it for less than $100? I had like a bucks? tax bill this year for crypto for the first time in my life because of this. Ah. That's funny. Well, somebody's getting rich. And as usual, it's uh, the behind the scenes people who provide the highest bid, 0.04 ETHs. Yeah, let's get that up there, people. Come on. 122 bucks for one edition. First Come on. One. First one. Although the first, if the first tweet, as uh, I, I, I hijacked that, if the first tweet isn't going to do it, I don't know that the first. Well, I mean, it's still going for 10,000. It wasn't 29 million. <laughs> I kind of feel bad for the guy who spent the 29 million until I realized <laughs> he probably didn't spend 29 million dollars. He's probably spent some Bitcoin he had lying around or something. Yeah. No, I'm. Sh a lot of this, I think, is driven by people who made a lot of money. They right. have a lot of money, and they're not. They're not the kind of people that want to want something on the wall. They want something electronic, and so yeah. it provides something electronic. And you know, they. That's right. It's also art is also a great way to, uh, you know, launder money. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, rarible.com. Go on and get your tech meme ride home podcast. The very first, as far as we know, podcast NFT. There, no one's been able to disprove it yet, and, and people have been <laughs> talking about it. That's awesome. Congratulations. So you're, a, you're a historic figure. Exactly. That's very good. That's Brian McCullough, Tech Meme Ride Home. It's easy to find. You just go to techmeme.com. It's on the front page there. Oh, but, of course, you probably should subscribe in your favorite podcast player so you don't have to think about going anywhere. It just arrives exactly. magically. Uh, are you doing anything else, uh, or is that a? That's probably a full time gig, I would imagine. It is, although the podcast, sorry to say, raised a venture fund recently. Wait a minute, what? <laughs> yes, uh, it's, you it's not only have an fund. NFT, but you have a venture fund. Yeah, it started in October. All of the LPs are listeners of the show. Um, it's a tiny, I'm, tiny fund. It's only an early you're stage. You're like a but, king um, of much, the new how much finance. Drinks? Uh, three mil, but it's a, it's a rolling fund, and so uh, that could go up too because any any um, uh, credited investor could invest. Uh, but it's it's been beautiful because we're running it open kimono style. Every company we invest in, we have them come on the show, talk about what they're doing. So even if you're not an investor in the podcast, uh, hopefully, or in in the fund, sorry. Uh, all of the listeners of the podcast will become um, fans of wow, you. You're quite the innovator. Ridehomefund.com. That is true. You're quite... When you say $3 million, is that like people have given you $3 million to invest? As of this moment, $3, $3 million. Now, wow. it's a rolling fund, so next year we'll see how many people re-up. And, and have you invested anything yet? Yes, 18 companies, wow. of which only four are on there because, again, we're leveraging the show. Um, you know, we don't want to announce it until it's useful to the companies. And so when you come on and say, hey, here's what we're doing, we're, we, we want to be introduced to this company or we, we're hiring in this area. So uh, we've invested in 18 companies, uh, but uh, we'll see how long it takes. Brian, I'm that. guessing that you're 39. 39? Why do you say that? Because that's when people, you know, really kick into gear, like Bill Gates and exactly. Mr. Zuckerberg. And I think you, you're kicking into gear, my friend. Sadly, I'm 44. Oh, but, uh, well, you're a little you, late. Leo. That's okay. It's close enough. Yeah. That's close yeah. enough. You probably had the idea for this when you were 39. Uh, no, but no. listen, uh, <laughs> look, the fact that, that you can do this through AngelList, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Listen, I, I, I derailed everything. I apologize. 
Uh, no, this right is. Uh, I'm asking you for your plug, and this is it. This is great. In fact, I'm I'm blown away. Ride home fun. Tech meme ride home. You're the is the king podcast. of DeFi. Yes. <laughs> Not only that, and by the way, it's early stage, right? So these are really these yes. are like ground floor, getting in on the ground floor of these companies. Which is which is Leo. Why I think it works is that like look, no you have one deal flow. Well, but no one that is raising a hundred million dollars series B or C needs me. Right. But a certain type of company that wants to reach tens of thousands of people that work in tech um, might. I just use kicked a boost. myself. I didn't think of this. That's all. Mm. You can do it. <laughs> no. It <laughs> <laughs> Nor am I going to offer an NFT. But we might have cupcakes on our twentieth anniversary show. I'm just saying, hang in there for that. RideHomeFund.com. I love it. No, Thank that's you, great. Leo. That's Thank great. You. And don't forget Rarible <laughs> for your chance to yeah, get in. You know what? If I, if, I, if the NFT goes high enough, then forget the fun. You know? <laughs> yeah, because you don't get to keep the three million, but you get to right, keep exactly. the point zero four ETH. I'm just I'm a river to my people, as <laughs> they say. That's exactly you know? right. Yeah. Yep. Harry McCracken, the technologizer. Did you think back in 1996 we'd be sitting here doing this? Global technology editor at Fast Company. And look what you're using, an iPad I'm mini. using an iPad Pro. Um, it's the small iPad oh, Pro. Oh, it's the 11-inch iPad yeah. Pro. Not I the love mini. it. The size is just perfect. Yeah, um, yeah. That's much your happier computer? With is that your main computer? It's my main computer, and I'm much happier than when I use the larger one just because it's more portable and it works much better as a tablet than the you larger You write all those great articles on Fast Company on that thing? 98% of the stuff I've written since 2011, I've written on an iPad. Wow. Wow. That's, I feel like Carpal Tunnel is uh, in your future. I, don't I know. hope not. I just feel pretty good at the Do moment. they? Okay. Because there's no travel on that, right? It's no just, travel, but I, yeah. I've okay. never liked travel on keyboards. I've never been right. a keyboard snob at all. Nice. I'm so glad you came up. Thank it's, you. It's been great. It's wonderful to uh, see let's you. Let's hope that... Um, you continue to have people in the studio. Gradually, inch by inch, we're working Fingers on. crossed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, really nice to see you, Harry. And, of course, Alex, Lindsay, I'll see you on Tuesday. Yep. If you want to hire Alex to test your uh, G5's satellite capabilities. Yeah. I'm there. I'm there. He's there for it. has to have sandwiches. Oh, <laughs> pay him in sandwiches. Oh, nine oh. No, I'm sure he actually wants real dollars. Oh, nine oh dot media is his, is his uh, business. But, of course... Uh, the thing that he's doing that is also groundbreaking, officehours.global, soon to be seen on the 6 megahertz band of satellite or something. On Working on it. Yeah. Uh, right now, though, you go to officehours.global. You can watch the YouTube videos. You can join the Zoom conversation, uh, fill out a form, get an invitation, all sorts of stuff, even things like cooking on the weekends. Except, is it the geekiest cooking? Because it's people cooking from their home, but they have a multicam setup. So yeah, everybody right. talking to each other is like, let me show you the it's close amazing. up of what I'm doing here. And I don't understand amazing. how to do this. And so it's, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, we take it to a, a different, I take everything a little over. Honestly, over the top. that's kind of our this thing. This is the most innovative thing going on in, uh, in uh, internet media right now. It's really fascinating what you're doing with it. Officehours.global. Uh, and it's pretty much all the time. It's like 24, it's 24 <laughs> I'm coming out of this. I'm just going to go hang out with everybody. It's like the, it's for 24 hours a day. There's like a, there's basically the most geeky water cooler you can possibly That's imagine awesome. is you just sit there and, awesome. and uh, yeah, it's fun. It's great to have you, Alex. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on Tuesday. Yes. We'll find something it's, it's always to fun. talk about. I love Apple and I love Mac break, but it's really fun to be on Twit because yeah. it's just, it's not quite as talk about uh, other stories. focused. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. It's definitely not focused today. It's a little blurry <laughs> all around. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you all of uh, you for uh, listening and watching. We do it live uh, on the stream. If you want to watch us do it live every uh, Sunday, about 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, 21.30 UTC, you can go to live.twit.tv. There's live audio and video streams there. Now, if you're watching live, you might want to, you know, exclaim what the hell is this to other people who are also watching live and that's what the irc is for irc.twit.tv you can join with a web browser or an irc client of course club twit members also can uh, yell at the clouds in our uh, beautiful discord server so we'd love to see you in either of those places after the fact on-demand versions of the show are available on the web at our website twit.tv I think all 17 years worth of episodes, all 871 episodes are there. 
So you can download, go back in time if you want, download any one of those, including Harry's first appearance in 2008. You can also uh, go to the YouTube channel where not all of the episodes, but almost all the video episodes live and watch there. Best thing to do, though, if you want to listen to the latest, is subscribe in your favorite podcast client. That way you'll get it automatically. As soon as it's done, the editors are going to get a hold of it, cut out all the cuss words, and put it up on the uh, on the internet via RSS. If you subscribe in your podcast player and they allow for reviews, do leave us a five-star review. We would really appreciate that. It's hard to believe, but after 17 years in the business, there's still one or two people who've never heard of Twit. So spread the good news. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. Another Twit. This is, is amazing. Okay.